Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. I'd like to welcome everyone to our hearing today entitled An Update on the Department of Energy's Science and Technology Priorities. I will recognize first myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, before we convene the hearing, I would like to recognize the absence of our friend and the chairman of this committee, Mr. Lucas of Oklahoma. Recently, he endured an, energy, uh, an injury while working on his farm. Uh, Frank is obviously a huge presence on Capitol Hill, both personally and legislatively, and only Frank could prove conclusively that a member of Congress should not tangle with a thousand pound bull. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to keep him in your prayers and your thoughts and to wish him a speedy recovery. I know that uh, we will uh, rest easier when he's back with us here on the committee. Uh, today, the Science Technology Committee will examine the U.S. Department of Energy's goals and priorities for its civilian research, development, demonstration, and commercial application programs. I would like to welcome the Honorable Jennifer Granholm and thank her for her testimony this morning. Secretary Granholm, since your last appearance before this committee, which I believe was in May of 2021, the DOE has been substantially transformed. With the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act last year, the DOE received $100 billion in supplemental funding. These laws have created over 70 new programs and increased the DOE's Office of Loan Program Authority to $400 billion. To administer these new programs, the DOE underwent a major structural reorganization and expansion, creating a new undersecretary position, several new program offices, separating energy demonstration projects from their core research and development activities, and the hiring of over 1,000 new employees at DOE. In the light of these massive changes, which the DOE was tasked with seemingly overnight by Congress, I, along with many of my colleagues here on the dais, are justified in having several serious concerns. The DOE has been placing an unprecedented focus on its applied programs, and I'm troubled by the comparative lack of support for the Office of Science. The DOE Office of Science and its national laboratories play a critical role in maintaining U.S. leadership in emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence, quantum information sciences, and fusion energy. Unlike applied research, which the private sector provides abundant resources to fund, the Office of Science conducts basic research, which the federal government provides a primary role in supporting. While the Office of Science accounts for nearly 20% of DOE's annual funding, it unfortunately received less than 2% of IIJA and IRA funds. And while its mission is essential to DOE's overall mandate, the department, through its budget proposals and administrative actions, I believe, continues to demonstrate an indifference to this central responsibility. So I hope to discuss that with you today. This directly hampers our ability to innovate and compete with our adversaries, especially the Chinese Communist Party. Instead of doubling down on already funded applied energy programs, I believe the DOE should rebalance its portfolio by reprioritizing support for the Office of Science. The DOE can accomplish this by fully implementing this science committee's responsible and well-vetted authorization of this office, which was included in the CHIPS and Science Act last year. Also, as the chairman of the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee, I am deeply concerned about the department's lack of resources assigned to the Office of Inspector General. It's troubling to me that among the hundreds of billions in newly appropriated funds and loan authorities, less than one-tenth of one percent was allocated to the OIG to oversee this new spending. This lack of oversight amplifies my concerns about the DOE's ability to implement critical research and development programs with the necessary safeguards to protect taxpayer dollars. Today, despite engagement with the DOE over many of these concerns, I remain skeptical about the department's ability to smoothly oversee the distribution of over $100 billion in addition to its annual $45 billion budget with the necessary guardrails in place. In fact, we have already experienced some problems with how these funds are being dispersed. In the fall of last year, the DOE selected a company with known links to the Chinese Communist Party to receive $200 million in federal funding. After several congressional inquiries over this alarming development, the DOE ended award negotiations with this company. However, as of this morning, the DOE has refused to provide us with its reasoning for terminating this agreement. The committee is waiting to receive a classified briefing by the department regarding this critical issue, and our expectation is that we will receive more information on this shortly. 
In addition, over the past few months, Energy Subcommittee Chairman Williams and I have submitted letters to the Department requesting information on a disturbing trend of conflict of interest violations. Most recently, our oversight touched on your own practices, Madam Secretary. As public servants, I believe it's critical that we hold ourselves to the highest levels of integrity with the American people, not only in practice, but also in public perception. I hope that we have an opportunity for a productive discussion on these issues this morning. This is an unprecedented time at the Department of Energy. Americans deserve access to a secure, resilient, and affordable energy network, which permits competition and increases reliability instead of picking winners and losers in the marketplace. But we must neither break the bank nor cut corners to get this job done, and I know you share those sentiments. I want to thank you for your willingness to participate in our hearing today. I look forward to an update on your vision for the DOE and how the Department intends to carry out congressional direction in a way that maximizes the return on investment for the U.S. taxpayer. So with that, uh, Madam Secretary, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for attending the hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> you can tell I'm a rookie at this. Uh, I, I, it's my honor to recommend our ranking members. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lofgren Chairman. For her opening statement. Uh, and I join you with w well wishes for uh, Chairman Lucas. I've let him know that we stand ready to assist in any way while he recovers. And thank you, Secretary Granholm, for being here today. As you know, this committee has played a leading role in shaping uh, energy policy through the last Congresses, which includes the major contributions in Chips and Science, the IRA, and Energy Act of 2020. Uh, and as we focus on energy innovation, one of the areas I'm particularly focused on is uh, U.S. fusion uh, research. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why I sought the ranking member position of this uh, committee. I'm excited about the real breakthroughs we've seen in fusion over the last two years. Uh, ignition at the National Ignition Facility late last year, as well as even more progress in the last few months at the NIF. Um, and I'm also encouraged by rapid growth in the private sector uh, on fusion energy and the major technical achievements they're now uh, bringing forward. I'm very happy that you and the President uh, proposed funding that matched what we have authorized for uh, fusion research, uh, a 32% increase. Uh, a vast improvement over every other prior uh, president, but there's a lot more to be, uh, to be done to keep the United States in the lead and ahead of our competitors, including uh, communist uh, China. Unfortunately, I'm concerned that neither the House or Senate appropriations marks are where we need to be at this point. Uh, I'm disappointed that the top line levels uh, that they have proposed for fusion research is low, but the details also matter. Uh, the most recent long-range plan produced by the Fusion Energy Science Advisory Committee recommended substantial uh, increases in support for materials and fusion nuclear science R&D and for public-private partnerships under any fusion budget scenario. This would include flat or modest growth scenarios that would be consistent uh, with the total funding uh, that's currently be being proposed by both bodies. Now, the President's budget requests follow these recommendations, but our marks do not. However, um, we need to take a look at how we can rescue that. Uh, you know, we're getting reports daily about the increasing uh, deterioration of the conditions of our planet. Just today, an article in Scientific American noted that there are sectors uh, of our planet that are in such dire health that we're on a, on a plane to not have a planet that is habitable by humankind. If you take a look at what is on the horizon to rescue our planet, uh, the most promising is fusion energy and its capacity to play an important role in decarbonizing the environment through direct carbon capture as well as carbon uh, in the ocean, which is one of the reasons why I am so, so focused on the need to do what's right on the fusion research program at this time. We are at a turning point, and when you take a look at, at the stakes 
and the amount of resources that we are not allocating, it really is impossible to defend. So uh, I'm hoping, Madam uh, Secretary, that you will be able to address uh, this issue in your remarks today and afterwards. Obviously, you are not responsible for, for what the House and Senate does uh, in appropriations. You made the appropriate request. But if we fail, I will look to you to reallocate uh, resources, because if we fail at this critical time uh, to put resources into the material science uh, provisions, we will be letting down uh, our country and the world. The private sector companies who are doing a lot, they don't have the capacity to do this research, and only we can fund it for the various science entities that have that capacity. So that is um, uh, the major concern that I have uh, at this hearing. I look forward to hearing uh, from you. And as you know, the Fusion uh, program has received bipartisan support in this House and in the Senate. It's got bicameral support. Um, and I do think that we are almost at an emergency time uh, for this program. So. Uh, Please help me understand what we can do uh, as an administration if we are unable to correct the deficit and the defects that have been already engaged in in the appropriations process. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Lofgren. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our witness today is Secretary Jennifer Granholm, the 16th Secretary of the United States Department of Energy. Uh, Secretary Granholm, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your testimony. Great. Thank you so much, Chairman Olbernote and uh, Ranking Member Lofgren and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here with you today to discuss the Department of Energy Science and Innovation priorities. Over the last uh, two and a half years, it's been my great privilege to be able to lead this agency, which I fondly refer to as America's Solutions Department from unlocking the secrets of our universe to developing innovative tools and algorithms to building cutting edge technologies, groundbreaking scientific solutions are at the core of DOE's DNA. This work is critical to ensuring the United States can outcompete our rivals, uh, outmaneuver aggressors and deliver more reliable, resilient energy for our people, especially as we face unprecedented challenges. Last week, the World Meteorological Organization confirmed that this was the hottest summer ever recorded on Earth. In July and August, average temperatures were roughly 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels, which is the exact threshold scientists have warned that we cannot breach without causing catastrophic and irreversible changes to our climate. Our communities are suffering the consequences, fiercer heat waves, hurricanes, wildfires, floods that are only going to become more frequent and costly in the coming years. Indeed, there have been 23 extreme weather events this year costing over a billion dollars so far. It's only September. The record for those kind of events, a uh, billion dollar events in the past has been 20 in a year, and that was for the whole year. So no doubt climate change is one of the greatest scientific challenges that we've ever faced. And on the flip side, it also presents one of the greatest economic opportunities of this century. The global market for decarbonization technologies is expected to reach $23 trillion, at least, by the end of the decade. America's innovation capabilities uniquely position us to corner this market, and thanks to the bipartisan assistance that we've received from Congress, the department, as was noted, now has more tools than ever to drive those efforts forward. With the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which granted appropriations for many of the programs authorized by the Energy Act of 2020, we're marshalling DOE's applied science breakthroughs out of the lab, onto the marketplace, and into the field. And as of today, I'm proud to say that we've launched 98% of our programs under IRA and Bill. We're funding demonstration projects for next generation technologies like clean hydrogen, long duration energy storage, advanced nuclear, direct air capture. We're working closely with industry to uh, accelerate their commercialization. 
And we're making the United States the most attractive destination for investment in new energy technologies, which will boost our energy security and independence. All of this will ensure American workers and families reap the benefits of our scientific capabilities through good paying jobs and lower energy bills. Still, we know maintaining our edge depends on continuous innovation, and thanks to this committee's efforts, the Chips and Science Act granted the first ever comprehensive authorization of DOE's Office of Science, which will help us to secure US leadership at, in the technologies of the future. President Biden's budget request for fiscal year 24 calls for 8.8 .8 billion in appropriations for this office, advancing toward the CHIPS authorized level so we can get to work. This includes more than a billion dollars for fusion research, one of the most exciting pieces of our basic portfolio of science. Our Lawrence Livermore, as was noted, National Lab now achieved fusion ignition not just once but twice, and in the meantime, We've hired a new associate director for our fusion office. We've awarded $46 million to companies who are advancing commercial fusion energy. The president's budget request would allow us to fully capitalize on those breakthroughs. It will also uh, let us accelerate progress in the emerging field of artificial intelligence. DOE has been harnessing AI technologies since the 1960s, giving us unique insight into their power and limitations as we're reaching a threshold where they may be used, as was uh, noted in this, uh, in the Capitol yesterday, for more widespread applications for good and for bad. We are uh, eager to use AI for good in science. The department's been able to make real progress in these matters thanks to Congress. But there's more work ahead. Our ability to tackle it depends on your continued support. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I look forward to taking your questions. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Granholm, for your testimony. And I know we're all eager to uh, ask you some more questions about your vision for the future of the DOE. Uh, I'll begin by uh, recognizing myself for five minutes for questions. In my opening statement, I mentioned my concerns about a lack of additional funding for the Office of Science within the DOE. Uh, and the point that I made is that uh, funding basic science is a fundamental part of the DOE's mission. Uh, when we talk about applied science, that's a field where there's abundant resources in the private sector to also provide funding research for research. But basic science, often it's government that provides that fundamental source of funding. So uh, I am concerned that less than 2% of the IIJA and IRA resources are being put towards basic science with the Office of Science. Could you address that concern and tell me whether or not you share it? Well, um, we have put forward a robust Office of Science budget, and it is important that science, along with applied uh, and strategies to deploy these technologies, all work in a continuum. Office of Science has been instrumental and will continue to be instrumental in being the framework on which all of the rest of the architecture of this new energy economy, the existing and the new energy economy, will rest. So I agree with you about the importance. I don't agree with you about deprioritizing. We have prioritized science. We have asked for an increase in science. We want to get to the authorized level of the Chips and Science Act. We hope that we can get there within the next two years. Well, I'm, it sounds like we're in furious agreement on it. All right, it. So good. Look forward to working with you on making sure that basic science is not neglected. Uh, I also mentioned in my opening statement my concerns about a lack of additional funding for the Office of the Inspector General within the DOE. We had a hearing in this committee several months ago in which we had testimony from several OIGs uh, within our committee's sphere of jurisdiction, uh, including that of the DOE. Uh, and those concerns were surfaced in that hearing. In particular, I'm concerned that we are asking you to distribute $100 billion in new funding, and yet only one-tenth of 1% 1 of that actually goes to the OIG to oversee the distribution of that funding and make sure the rules are being followed. Is that a concern that you share, and what can we do to address it? Well, I know that the OIG office uh, request is a doubling of the funding of what it was last year, which is important recognition that oversight is very important. We agree on this as well, that oversight is necessary. 
We uh, are in uh, constant contact with our OIG to make sure that we are setting up programs in a way that are consistent with protecting the taxpayer dollars, making sure we are uh, doing things uh, in the right way. So we believe that the OIG should be funded at the level that is necessary. And to that end, I know that there has been a doubling request. Okay. What, what do you think will be the department's response to that request? Well, we have put forward uh, that. That's part of what our budget request is. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I think that uh, we all agree on the importance of the role that the OIG plays in making sure that there's transparency and accountability within the department. Yes. It's, uh, uh, having those resources available just forestalls future problems. And so I'm uh, appreciative that you share our point of view on that. Um, one more thing that I wanted to discuss with you is uh, the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource, which is something that's very near and dear to me, my heart. Uh, as you know, AI is going to play an increasingly critical role in uh, the development of our economy and the empowerment of American workforce. Uh, I am concerned, though, that the concentration of the power to create advanced AI uh, foundational models might wind up resting in the hands of only a couple of companies. Uh, and that's something I think would be very destructive to entrepreneurialism and transparency in our country. It's been our tradition that academia has been the home of cutting edge research and the transparency that's enforced by our academic system I think has been good not only for advancing the frontiers of human knowledge but also for giving the public the confidence that uh, this information is being developed and shared transparently. Uh, the purpose of this resource would be to make sure that our academic institution, our researchers, and our students have a shared resource available to them to be able to access the amount of commute, compute that's necessary to, to do this research. Is that something that the DOE supports? Because you would have a fundamental role to play in overseeing it. Yeah, the NAIR process is something we support, and we've also put forward a strategic plan called FAST. So NAIR, um, we are in partnership with the National Science Foundation. That goal is to basically um, sort of democratize AI and to make sure it does get out into the academic institutions so that we can create a workforce for AI. There's a component of it that is more secure, that relates to national defense, that is the part that's being led by the Department of Energy. And then because we have these massive computers, these exascale computers, onto which so much of the AI capabilities um, are uh, that offer is to the private sector as user facilities. We want to make sure that the foundational models, as you say, are done as well in the national labs in addition to academia. Uh, we'll look forward to working with you on that. I see my time has expired. I will now remember to recognize the ranking member for five minutes for her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. As I mentioned, I am laser focused on the fusion energy program. I think we are in a race uh, against time for the planet, and fusion is a key element to saving uh, our climate. Uh, along those lines, the Fusion Energy Science Advisory Committee had a long-range plan, and the emphasis was on material and fusion nuclear science, as well as the milestone program. Now, they did not include the inertial fusion program that uh, has been in the mark, but that was prior to uh, ignition being achieved, so I'm not going to quibble with uh, that emphasis. But the, you and the President asked for an increase in material and fusion, uh, materials and fusion nuclear science from 56.5 million to 147.5 million, uh, almost double. Can you explain why R&D in fusion materials and fuel cycle technologies are important at this particular moment. Well, this is a crucial time. I'm so grateful to you for your leadership on f fusion, uh, Congresswoman. It's such uh, an important potential for solving the greatest crisis that we're facing, which is climate change, as you noted. The request is actually um, strengthening the milestone uh, program. So we want to be able to put out benchmarks of what barriers we need to break through in order to achieve commercial fusion. Uh, the goal is to achieve commercial fusion within a decade. And so the portions of that that are related to the milestone program, that's a $105 million increase. We also have R&D centers in the following areas in structural uh, and plasma-facing materials, 
in the blanket fuel cycle in enabling technologies and advanced simulation. That's part of this is a $120 million increase. And then additionally supporting uh, studies and research for more fusion neutron source facility. That is, an, is going to be an important part of the future. All of these, of course, the inertial fusion uh, energy program uh, it has a small increase, but we are all about that and, and are very excited about the milestones that have been achieved this year. So we, uh, we are excited about uh, being able to take these next steps in partnering with the private sector uh, to be able to achieve this goal of a commercial fusion um, facility within 10 years. Um, thank you for that answer. I was going to ask about the milestone program, which is the other element that the um, experts recommended for emphasis and that I believe needs attention. What I'm hearing from the scientists who are out in the private sector is the materials research in terms of materials for containment walls as well as fuels is something that they don't have the, the resources and lab capacity to do to study in the same way uh, that we would fund in the national labs or in, in some cases uh, the academic uh, world. So it's very important that we uh, focus in at least on those two because it cannot be done and for any of the various alternatives for private sector fusion, um, all of that will be necessary. I would just, one other question. Uh, several have suggested to me that we need an applied energy office for fusion as we do for other uh, energy sources. I'm wondering if you could uh, comment on that proposal. Are there any steps that you think would be wise for the department to take in that direction? It's certainly something we have been uh, considering. And as this continues, as we continue to see the promise of fusion coming to reality, that is uh, certainly something we would consider. As you know, as I mentioned, we've just hired a new director of fusion sciences, and we're excited about that. So this is a conversation that is live, I'll just say that. Let me just uh, go into one other element. We already have um, private sector firms that are doing direct carbon capture out of the air. The problem is they don't have a non-polluting energy source to fuel that effort. Uh, we know how to do that, we just need fusion energy to ramp it up. NSF has done some research on carbon capture out of the ocean, which is the biggest sink of carbon ever. That is a more complicated endeavor than direct carbon uh, capture from the air. I'm wondering if you are looking at uh, some additional research that would guide us on carbon capture from the ocean so that as we're racing uh, for a fusion source, we're going to have the capacity to actually utilize that source to decarbonize our planet and save the day uh, for humanity. Yeah, I know we're looking at all sources, potentially, um, soils, ocean, et cetera, uh, obviously direct air capture. We want to um, continue research in all of this, and I can follow up on the ocean component with you uh, after this. I don't have the details in front of me, but I know we are looking at it. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Lofgren. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, for five minutes for your questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Obonati. Uh Secretary Granholm, what is the Department of Energy doing to lower the price of gasoline, electric, and natural gas for Americans? Well, supply obviously has been a big component of that, and we are now at record levels of production of both natural gas and of oil. And hopefully, I mean, obviously oil is traded on a global market. And so what happens internationally with OPEC, et cetera, has an impact on us at home. However, our oil and gas companies have uh, really stepped up to try to fill some of that gap. And, um, and, uh, and that's is, important. What is the agency doing to encourage any, any decrease in those prices? Well, we don't have, obviously the prices are met on, a, on the private sector, on a market, so we don't have direct impact on that market. Like killing drilling in Anwar? That, no, that has nothing to do with the price today. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, uh, what is the administration's specific plan to increase electric vehicle sales from the current 7% level uh, to the 36% level uh, proposed by, by rule? in 2027? Um, are you talking about the EPA rule? Is that what you mean? Yes. Um, 
the administration is, or at least the Department of Energy, is uh, doing everything possible to bring down the price of electric vehicles by investing in research and development on battery technology. The price of vehicle batteries has already dropped by 85% over the past more than a decade, and a lot of that is due to DOE research. We're also um, making sure that the uptake of electric vehicles is easier for people who may have range anxiety because there's not a sufficient amount of charging, uh, charging network. And so we have partnered with the Department of Transportation with a, a joint office that is uh, set up to put out funding to achieve 500,000 additional electric vehicle charging units across the nation, both in transportation corridors as well as in areas where the private sector has not seen fit to put up charging stations, perhaps because there's no electric vehicles. So we're trying to solve the chicken and egg issue on, on that, and we're trying to bring down the price. And of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, by reducing the price at the, on the hood of vehicles, electric vehicles as they're purchased, will also make them more attractive. Okay. Uh, what's the total amount of uh, fiscal year 2023 grants to uh, and subgrants to support researchers that are citizens of other countries. Uh, I mean, I'm told we have we have some that have gone to Iranians, North Koreans, Russians, and China, and I'm just wondering if that's correct. Uh, no, our funding is, uh, and in fact, I signed an executive order saying the research, et cetera, uh, and the funding for research has to be done, and the technologies in the, in our labs has to be uh, commercialized in the United States. Okay, so are applicants or grants and subgrants uh, required to provide uh, the department with specific information about each foreign national listed on the application? Um, so um, I'm not sure if you're talking about entities from f foreign entities of concern. Um, I'm, I'm talking about any applications we, for grants and subgrants. Um, we, we look very carefully to make sure that grantees are not um, controlled by foreign entities of concern. And that means uh, that we, we are not, whether you're talking about Iran or Russia or China or North Korea, we are not providing grant money to entities from those countries. But, but, but do we require them to provide DOE with specific information about each foreign national listed on the application? Um, we do not require uh, grantees to list out the citizenship of everybody who applies. Um, if a Canadian uh, a person who was born in Canada applies for a grant and is building a business in the United States, um, we don't reject that, uh, that situation. We, we are particularly attuned to those foreign entities of concern. Yeah, Can Canada is... I think a friend of ours. I'm thinking of well, right, but countries you said that any. may not be friends. Right, you said any, so that's why I'm, I understand what you're getting at, and that's why I'm saying the foreign entities of concern, those four countries, uh, we are very attuned to. Thank you, and, and just curious, when was the last time you attended a cabinet meeting with the president? Yesterday. Very good, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. A gentleman yields back. We'll go next to the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Obernolte, and thank you, Ranking Member Lofka. And I join you in sending uh, best wishes to Chairman Lucas for a speedy recovery. Welcome, uh, Secretary Granholm, to the committee. Uh, last Congress, we made historic investments in renewable energy that will jumpstart our clean energy future. And Oregon continues to work toward 100% clean energy economy by testing and deploying novel energy technologies, including advanced battery storage, marine energy, small modular nuclear energy, and offshore wind power. Uh, I don't think it's a surprise that your Undersecretary for Science and Innovation, Dr. Jer uh, Jerry Richmond, came to you from, uh, from Oregon, my alma mater, University of Oregon. Uh, Oregon researchers like the team at PacWave are tapping the vast potential of the ocean by leveraging wave energy and deploying clean energy resources will create good paying jobs, lower costs, and address the climate crisis. So as we develop the next generation of renewable energy technologies, we must also invest in grid capacity and resilience, and importantly, in an energy smart workforce. So last month, the Department of Energy announced a $39 million investment from the Grid Modernization Initiative for projects across its national laboratories to strengthen the grid 
and enhance climate resilience. So importantly, these selected projects include the Medium Voltage Resource Integration Technology, or MERIT, which is intended to develop high efficiency technologies that can integrate a range of energy resources, such as solar, wind, and fuel cells into the grid. So, uh, Madam Secretary, as we adopt these advanced technologies and diversify uh, ener uh, energy generation resources, how can Congress and the Department of Energy support additional R&D programs like MERIT that will make direct, direct investments in grid modernization efforts to balance the goals of broadening our clean energy resources and also securing that, that important grid resilience? Great. Thank you so much for the question, and thanks uh, for your support for the mission of the Department, and uh, especially on the science side. Um, one of the biggest ways, of course, you can help is by um, funding the budget uh, to, at the requested exactly. amount. Um, we are, this issue about grid um, resilience and reliability in the light of the fact that we now have many more types of energy on the grid is extremely important. Um, and the technologies associated with long duration energy storage, for example, to ensure that uh, renewable energy, which is intermittent, becomes more like base load. And if you add, of course, storage to that, they become a reliable source of constant uh, energy. Those kinds of things, as well as grid enhancing technologies like that, are, that create more efficiency on the grid and that create uh, more um, uh, s stable power, I'll just say, uh, uh, dynamic line rating, um, advanced reconductoring materials, et cetera, all very, very important, uh, both on the research side and on the deployment side. And we appreciate the exactly. support for uh, for the research on from this committee. Th thank you. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about marine energy, because we know the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, but the waves and the currents don't stop. Uh, so, Madam Secretary, the Inflation Reduction Act has created more than 170,000 clean energy jobs so far, projected, projected to generate 1.5 million more in the next decade. So I was recently visiting the Vestist Wind Systems Training Center in Portland, Oregon. It's pretty exciting. Uh, work that they're doing there uh, to discuss how we can work together to grow a diverse and talented clean energy workforce. So what is the department doing to help train and retain talent for the clean energy workforce? And what are the gaps in clean energy education and training and how can Congress and the department uh, work to resolve them? Great, thank you. Um, the workforce issues in this area are, are enormous. The opportunities are enormous for people to be able to transition from um, fossil energies to, if they choose to, to clean energies. It's also really critical to know that there's all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people in this very broad clean energy space. So whether you are talking about somebody doing geothermal or wave or line people for uh, installing the grid or designing the components for the grid or nuclear, I mean, all of it uh, creates huge opportunities. There was another report out this morning that said I think 127,000 jobs had been created. I don't know if that's consistent with what you said or maybe it was 142,000, but there's, these jobs are being created even before groundbreakings have, have fully happened as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. So it is happening all over. The question about workforce training is very important. So what the department is focused on is when we do a grant, for, uh, for a facility. So say we're, we've given a grant, for example, in a, to a direct air capture hub in Louisiana. We wanna make sure that the applicant also has a, a, a strategy for, for what they are going to do for workforce. And that means they have to have a com community benefits plan, which includes workforce uh, training. How are they gonna get the workers? What's the pipeline look like? to be able to ensure that it's gonna be a success. So for all grants from the bipartisan infrastructure law, they all have to have a strategy associated with it. And then the White House is also very, being very uh, aggressive and conscientious about creating workforce hubs in key areas right. that we know these grants are, going, are coming through so that we have both um, private sector uh, strategies for apprentices as well as universities and community colleges all feeding in to what will be the economic opportunity of our life. Thank you. And as I yield back, I'll note that there are several members of this committee on both sides of the aisle, also on the Education and Workforce Committee. We look forward to working with Great. you on it. Thank you. Yeah. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll go next to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Bamman. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for being here, Madam uh, Secretary. First question in the Houston area, which I represent, uh, we're eager to hear from DOE 
uh, on the regional clean hydrogen hub funding, uh, which I'm told will be announced any day now. Uh, how is DOE working with the Treasury Department and others on the hydrogen production tax credit? Right. So yes, we are in the final stages of the hydrogen hub uh, evaluations and selections. And yes, we are working with Treasury to make sure that the hubs are a success. And in fact, today, one of the components of that is we are releasing a funding opportunity announcement for a demand side strategy for hydrogen uh, from the bipartisan infrastructure law. So all of those components are, are uh, under discussion right now. And hopefully the Treasury decision um, will be made uh, around the time of the hub announcements. And so bring that it they're to not fruition. Right. Yeah. OK. Second, uh, I'd like to ask you about US LNG imports, or excuse me, exports. exports. Uh, since you are responsible for considering export authorization permits, the United States has emerged as a leading LNG exporter, and according to the EIA, so far this year, we are the largest exporter of LNG in the world. Uh, we know that this is in no small part thanks to the science and technology innovation at DOE's national laboratories. What is DOE doing to support continued U.S. LNG exports, and is the administration trying to ease the burden on our LNG producers uh, to provide the world with clean LNG? Yeah, this is a really important question. I mean, first of all, as you've noted, we are at record levels. We are um, leading the world. We're providing this uh, source of fuel to our allies uh, in Europe, in Japan, et cetera. And at the same time, all of our allies, as well as we are, looking to make sure that that LNG is as clean as it possibly can be, right? So the we are looking at all of that. We have um, uh, permitted right now, existing permits for uh, LNG expansions are, uh, uh, get us to, I think, 20 billion uh, cubic feet uh, for the ones that are under construction, 49 billion for the ones that haven't even begun uh, construction. So we are permitted uh, to be able to deliver if, if uh, those who are proposing those developments actually uh, move forward. Uh, but we have to make sure, honestly, as a, as a nation and, and the industry, that the demand side of the equation will demand that methane uh, <coughs> leakage has been taken care of and that CO2 has, all greenhouse gases associated with LNG have been taken care of. And so that's part of what our research now is. How do we do methane monitoring, methane mitigation uh, in partnership with industry to make sure that uh, the LNG is in fact the cleanest uh, in the world, and that's a lot of what DOE's focus has been on from our fossil energy and carbon management office. There's no question about it, it's the cleanest. Uh, you, speaking of permits, you, men you mentioned permits, it's, it's disappointing to see this administration that has taken actions, many, many actions that uh, really denying permits, prohibiting drilling and production on U.S. public lands here just recently in Alaska. Uh, uh, which has essentially crippled much of our own domestic energy production. Uh, would, in fact, I think we're down to uh, a million barrels less production today uh, than we have been in the last three years. Okay, well, that, if that's not right, then you can, you can tell me what the correct number is. But I know we're not producing as much as we were. Uh, would you agree that buying oil from other countries actually supports dirtier, less clean energy production and more pollution? Do you agree that we should increase clean and efficient oil and gas production here in the United States where we have the most clean production of fossil fuels on the face of the earth, especially at a time when we need reliable, affordable energy? Wouldn't, 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 uh, wouldn't we be making a cleaner planet uh, if we relied more on U.S. producers? I know that's several questions in once, but right. if you could. Let, let me first, with respect, um, if you look at the Energy Information Administration, um, they are projecting, and right now, we are at record levels of production of oil and gas. The United States is more than ever before, more than before, co before COVID. We are producing at record levels. We're at, I think, 12.7 million barrels per day, or we will be by the end of this year. We'll be at 13 million by next year. So there is no blocking of production in the United States. So we, we are continuing to move, and we will continue to see that happen. I do think, though, uh, 
it is important if we want to address this big question about climate that the oil and gas industry partner on the solutions to mitigate the greenhouse gases that are produced. And so the partnering with uh, the industry on geothermal exploration, for example, or on um, obviously carbon capture and sequestration are very important components of the overall push, which is to expand clean energy, not just in the United States, but globally. But you didn't quite answer it. Should we be more rely, relying on our own domestic production? We want to. We are relying on our own. And, and I would say relying on our own so that we, also because of price. I mean, we, not, oil, of course, is uh, traded on a global market. But if we develop our own clean sources in the United States, we won't be subject to a volatile market uh, dis, you know, where decisions about production are made by those uh, f with whose values we do not share. Thank you. We yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Stevens. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Secretary. Thank you so much for your incredible leadership of America's Solution Department. I, I liked that uh, dubbing of the Department of Energy. You appear to be uh, in the right place at the right time with so many incredible initiatives running through the Department of Energy as we transition our clean tech sector and train the workforce of uh, the, the future that is hitting us today. But I, I do want to ask you a couple of quick questions uh, about uh, some recent DOE announcements. One, uh, we were pleased to see uh, just at the end of last month about the retooling initiative of the plants, the $15.5 billion, um, some of which has come through uh, the in, uh, Jobs and Infrastructure Investment Act. Uh, that we passed in 2021. And when I saw the announcement come down, uh, I was wondering if that initiative would have been possible without the IIJA being passed. Did you need that money? I know you drew down on some existing DOE money to put forward this, this retooling dollars. No, 100% we needed uh, it. And thank you so much for your support of making that happen. Yeah, and, well, and we're also excited to see that the, the bids have gone out and applications are going to close on December 7th. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing what, what comes out of those applications, particularly as industry in my neck of the woods is booming and I, I think aggressively looking to adopt and transition to electric vehicles. Mr. Babin asked about hydrogen and I had some similar questions. Um, most recently, I held a hi hydrogen roundtable in Auburn Hills at Quantron uh, and we, we heard from a number of very interesting enterprises, startups uh, that, are, that have developed in the hydrogen space and they were uh, the, the feedback I've received is that these companies, these startups, are, are eager to continue meeting, uh, eager to get the, the guidance, and are, are also looking to the Department of, of Energy, I think, for the, the overall hand-holding process. And so just curious, in addition to what Mr. Babin had just asked, but also from the viewpoint of the the hubs that are going out, I heard you say demand side, but anything else that we need to be thinking about as we are sort of in a fragile moment right now with hydrogen, we want to make sure this technology gets developed mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and is owned here in the United States of America. And these early stage companies, which I know you're so familiar with from your great career, are, are just precious to this process. So how is the department thinking about them? Yeah, I appreciate this question because we don't have a hydrogen economy really yet. I mean, hydrogen has been around. Uh, obviously, and in, in the industrial process, but we haven't used it in a more broad scale. And it and it could be, as they call it, the Swiss Army knife of uh, clean energy, because of course it can carry uh, energy, it can store energy, etc. But it's not going to happen on its own without some start. And that's what the uh, hydrogen hubs are all about. This is why the demand side strategy is important. It's also why we are considering what is the ecosystem that surrounds these hydrogen hubs? What's the offtake? Who are the customers? The hubs are kind of going to be, they're going to be a carry through. I, it, I, right. I mean, some stage. may be no. quite physically geographically connected. I know there have been applications um, that are more geographically dispersed, but the bottom line is, and, and what are the feedstocks essentially? You know, some I'm sure will have, uh, have applied who are interested in supplying uh, nuclear power, some renewable power, some natural gas. Bottom line is that whole ecosystem 
uh, in creating a hydrogen hub is a source of a new economy for the, the country. New and critical economy. And critical, but it's yeah. not just for the United States, it's as well for, for the other, world. The world. We We're, are in the lead in all the other countries in terms of what we have decided to do. Everybody's looking to us, but everybody's catching up very quickly. Right. And so it's uh, it's an exciting moment. And one other question for you. The Department of Energy put forward the critical materials assessment report that highlighted um, new materials and minerals that are expected to be vital to our clean energy future. This is somewhat going back to uh, electric vehicle batteries. Um, can you just provide any update from uh, the department and your work on, on critical materials and how you all are, are thinking about that, maybe working across government? Yeah, well, first of all, it's the foundation, right, for how we get to be energy independent. And we want to make sure that we are the place that are producing, for example, the batteries for electric vehicles. We've that means the whole thing, soup to nuts. We do not want to be reliant on China for the production uh, or processing of materials like lithium. We want to be able to uh, source that in the United States or source alternatives. And so we've got a whole strategy inside the department um, that is from extraction to uh, making sure that we have, are exploring alternatives, which is really heavy. Uh, this committee, I know, has been supportive of looking at alternatives uh, to making sure that those, uh, are, those materials are integrated into the battery, the anode, the cathode, the separator material, the electrolyte, all of that. The loan programs office is funding some components right. of this supply chain. The grant process is funding some components of this uh, supply chain. And the reason why you're seeing so many investments in Michigan, in, a, uh, in all of these states, is because they see the tax credit associated with the Inflation Reduction Act and the grant opportunities as making the United States the irresistible place to invest. Yeah. And so we are creating that supply chain thanks to the good work of many of those who are in this room. Well, with that, Mr. Chair, we close on a great note. United States is an irresistible place to invest. Madam Secretary, always a pleasure to ask you questions. Thank you. I yield. The gentlewoman yields back. We will hear next from the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischman. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you, um, Secretary Granholm, for visiting with me in my great city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. I know we work together very well with the DOE reservation in Oak Ridge, uh, so thank you so much for all of your hard work together with us. I have three questions. The first one I'm going to ask for a rather brief answer. It's on critical minerals. I do want to uh, touch on two nuclear issues as well. Uh, the development uh, of so many exciting new energy technologies has demonstrated the growing need for a range of critical minerals. The Department of Energy is implementing important efforts to develop and expand domestic critical minerals recycling efforts. That is laudatory. It's great. However, it seems increasingly clear that recycling and friendly, friendly foreign sources will be insufficient for the exploding market demand. Madam Secretary, if you can, very briefly, what is DOE doing to foster domestic critical mineral production? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, so we are, uh, through the Loan Program Office, of, uh, for example, um, there's been conditional commitments to lithium extraction. Uh, we have funded uh, lithium extraction from geothermal brines in the Salton Sea from uh, the er uh, earlier stage uh, efforts. We have funded uh, graphite material, anode material in Louisiana uh, as, a, again, a conditional commitment that the Loan Programs Office uh, has made to CIRA. So we are identifying the, the, the gaps in the supply chain and going after them strategically. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, as you know, I chair... Um Madam Secretary, five uh, nuclear-related caucuses, including the Fusion Caucus, which is a sixth. Uh, there's tremendous bipartisan and bicameral support in that regard. I would like to focus on the fission side for today, if I may. The Department of Energy has been making progress on the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, ARDP, including the Kairos Research Reactor and X Energy Triso Fuel Facility located in Oak Ridge. However, with all the new technologies, there are inherent challenges. 
What is the best, best path forward to making new nuclear a viable energy source? Specifically, how is DOE actively working to make these first-of-a-kind projects successful? Yeah, thank you for your leadership on nuclear as well. We are very excited. These, we, these advanced demonstration uh, projects are really important for us to be able to have lessons learned, obviously, and that there are different um, types of reactors that are being funded, whether, uh, and I will say this, Part of the opportunity is for our small modular reactors, for example, to be exported uh, that technology and to partner with allied countries, again, forming stronger relationships globally uh, through nuclear power, through the, uh, through the atom. But I, I do think that it's uh, uh, important to note that research uh, continues on all of these different uh, types of reactors in the Nuclear Energy Office, who I know you know Dr. Huff uh, well, and uh, the, although the, the demonstration project was moved by Congress to the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations because it is large scale, all of the symbiosis between research and development and deployment continue. There's a very strong uh, nexus so that we can learn uh, from the demonstration projects and, of course, uh, what's happening at Idaho National Lab, what's happening at Oak Ridge, all a component of the spectrum of nuclear investment. Thank you. And, Madam Chair, as you may know, before I get into my last question, uh, last week I was privileged uh, as a member of the House and, and the Chairman of Energy and Water Appropriations to speak in London at the International Nuclear Symposium. I want to thank you. Your department was present. Uh, you have two folks embedded it, it, at the English Embassy as well. So uh, we did a good job as Americans on the international stage. So I thank you for your cooperation in that regard. Uh, last question on nuclear fuel, if I may. We recognize the developing... Um, that developing a domestic source of high assay, low enriched uranium, HALU, uh, fuel for our advanced nuclear reactors is critical to our energy independence. So many of the promising advanced reactor designs, including many ARDP, require HALU. How is the Department of Energy prioritizing the build out of domestic HALU fuel supply? What is the biggest barrier to developing a domestic supply of HALU? Um, and, and I would say that in the energy and water bill, I made it a priority on the House side to put in uh, four point, I'm sorry, $2.4 billion uh, for new HALU. And I'll, I would defer Great. your answer. Thank you so much. I so appreciate, again, your leadership on this. We need a full-on uranium strategy from HALU, uh, you know, to, our, to the fuel that, um, uh, to low enriched uranium. We need a full cycle that we are providing in the United States so that we are not reliant upon Russia or other countries who don't have our interests at heart. So thank you for your leadership on that. We have a strategy. Um, I know that you've been briefed on it in terms of the full um, cycle. We, uh, we have a $700 million down payment on the HALU, which is important, but it's not going to be enough. So uh, we hope to be able to come back to you, um, this committee, as well as you in your other hats, uh, to be able to uh, request funding for that full strategy when, when the time is right. Thank you. Madam Secretary, I know I'm over my time. One last request that we talk to our good friends in the Senate. The House mark is very high. The Senate mark is not as, as, as high, but it's, it's respectable. But together, I think we can get there, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. We will hear next from the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bowman. You were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here. Uh, can you please talk to us about how public schools fit into your vision for the implementation of the IRA and the infrastructure bill? Uh, my understanding is that there was much more demand than could be accommodated, including from my district for the first round of funding from the Renew American Schools program. Schools are also eligible for some tax credits, but many will need technical support and bridge financing. I would love to hear what efforts are happening at DOE and in coordination with other agencies to help public schools take full advantage of all relevant funding opportunities in these bills. Great. This is absolutely a priority. Thank you so much for this question. I think what we saw from the first round of funding was it was wildly popular. We had over 1,000 applications and we could only fund 24 selections. And there, the need is enormous. And so, you know, we, we um, 
we, that was the first round. There will be another round. But there is no way that we will have enough money to fill the need that is clearly out there. So we'd love to come back and make sure that this particular program is, in fact, funded to the extent to meet the demand that is out there, because I think it is so vital for schools, for schools that want to be uh, making sure that they're obviously teaching children in environments that are clean, environments that are not causing asthma, environments. I was in uh, Tennessee, just quickly, um, and Memphis at one of the schools that won. And the school itself had windows that were so dark from uh, pollution that part of their Renew grant was just to replace windows so kids could see out. The, it was a 100 degree day. Their air conditioning wasn't working. No kids can work in an environment where they're, they're forced to work at 100, in 100 degree heat boxes. The lighting was horrible. They didn't have a science, uh, they didn't have any science lab in the school. So this school got some money to be able to do that. It was overwhelming how, um, how moving it was to be able to see the teachers and the students who were so thrilled that their school was actually going to be um, some, a place that they wanted to be able to learn about. So that's just one example. I know it is happening all across the country, and this demand is huge. Can you speak to a dollar amount? Like, how much do you think we are going to need to really invest in our public school infrastructure over the next decade, let's say? Because um, you mentioned a few challenges, but they've been, public schools have been falling apart across the country for many, many years. 100%, yeah, 100%. Just on this, I mean, we were given $500 million under the bipartisan infrastructure law. We did the first round, it's $178 million. We did 24 schools. So you can imagine it is exponentially larger than what we have. Got it. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to uh, bring up the United Auto Workers are on the verge of going on strike as soon as tomorrow, which is obviously can be devastating to the economy. In part, that is because the big three auto companies, uh, according to the United Auto Workers, are using the EV transition and public sub subsidies as a weapon to slash wages and labor protections. We also seen that across the country, and certainly in my district in Westchester County in the Bronx, New York, Black and brown communities are struggling to build the capacity and infrastructure to compete for climate and R&D funding. What is your overall assessment of how we are doing when it comes to centering workers in our most vulnerable communities in the clean energy transition right now? Where are we doing well, and where do we need to do better? Yeah, I think this is a really important question because the tax credits that companies take advantage of don't have the strings uh, attached to them. The grants that we can provide require these community benefit agreements, which, will, which we can negotiate with companies. So in some instances, we have more leverage as a nation than, than in others. But I think the whole point is that we want to create a clean energy economy, which, which has good paying quality jobs for people, and that all pockets of the country can benefit. And that's why when I say there's all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people, uh, this energy economy does give an opportunity for people to really have a job that can't be outsourced because the energy is produced here, it's clean, it's homegrown. Uh, this is the, this is the, for us, we have a whole clean energy jobs office and we are projecting in terms of job growth, enormous job growth, but we want to make sure they're good jobs. And that's why um, continuing to push and to pressure to make sure that the wages, and, and frankly, with the low unemployment rate, there is some incentive to raise wages, but we want to make sure that these are, are good wages. We require prevailing wage on our grants, uh, which is very important. Uh, we require a pathway for workforce, which is very important. There's an incentive embedded in the bills for paid apprenticeships, which is very important. So all of those are keys, I think, to remedying inequality. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from my colleague from California, Mr. Issa. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, the, these are never easy hearings, and I appreciate your being here and your answering so many important questions. Uh, mine is, is typical of, of my history and oversight. Uh, as you know, when you were going through confirmation, you agreed and were granted special privileges for eliminating any conflict of interest stocks. Uh, you did not do so uh, in a timely fashion, and as a result, it's reported that 240,520 shares of Proterra were still in your hands until you were questioned by the press, and then you sold them. Is that correct? No. I, I, when I did you sell them? 
I, saw, I sold them within three months of my taking office. I uh, told, I signed. And who did you sell them to? It was, I, I have no idea who's, who bought them. Um, were they sold onto a public market or onto a private no, market? They were on a private market, but handled by a separate entity, so I don't know who they went to. But I can tell you that I signed an ethics agreement uh, when I took on that I had to dis uh, dispose of those shares and resign from the board, uh, which I did before I even took office, within six months. And I sold within three months. Okay, just one quick follow-up uh, for the record. Um, this was under the uh, Exclusion Act, so there, the 1.6 million reported that you made on it is not taxable at this time. Is that correct? Mm. Uh, I think we just paid um, some significant... I, I, I have to get... Back. If you can answer yeah. that for the record. Um, it is not uh, the policy of this committee normally to show pictures, but I'm going to do it briefly just for one second because I think the visual is worthwhile for you. These are, these are some of the appliances that, if you will, GE said brings good things to life. They include uh, window air conditioners, washing machines, incandescent light bulbs, ceiling fans, and uh, automatic washers. The question I have for you, and I'm not going to belabor the, this because we don't usually use them here, but only a few minutes ago you talked about the stifling temperature of 100 degrees and the effect it has on, on children trying to get an education, and yet your department is calling for the elimination of these products, not for a standard uh, of higher efficiency, but elimination. Can you explain why you're calling for these products to be eliminated? Sir, we're not causing, causing any products to be eliminated. We're not calling for any products to be eliminated. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, the... Uh, the products that are listed as, as to, to be gotten rid of, let me just make sure I get it right. I'm, I apologize if, if, if you've missed uh, the reports the last few days of the phase out uh, or the elimination of ceiling fans and so on. You know nothing no, about this? What we do is provide for efficiency for those products. We never call for the elimination of the product. Well, but if, if your efficiency request exceed the, uh, the current technology, then they go away. Let me ask you a, a, a follow-up question that I, I think is, is undeniable. These are all electric appliances. You've called for an all-electric society. And I appreciate the goals that have historically come with both you and the EPA trying to increase efficiency. But at, when it's all said and done, why is it that your, your, your goals are estimated to eliminate these products completely? I understand the incandescent bulb. I'll leave that one aside. But the uh, ceiling fans uh, have no, uh, you know, they're motors. They turn. They blow. They are not likely to meet the standards that you're, you've set, and I'm sure you're aware of this. No, sir, they are going to easily ad, uh, meet standards. In fact, this, this morning or yesterday, the American home uh, appliance manufacturers reached an agreement with energy efficiency advocates on six of the very products that you've got on your thing, meaning the manufacturers believe they can reach the efficiency standards. And so it is happening. It's causing people to save money. I mean, it's, it reduces costs for everyday citizens if they don't have to spend as much money on their electric bill because their appliances are... Ma Madam Secretary, I might interrupt only to say it reduces energy consumption, and I appreciate with that. It doesn't always reduce cost, as you know. Many products actually cost more to operate because of the technical nature of them. Uh, so you, you save money on energy, you spend money on maintenance no. and, and capital cost. Well, I, I respectfully disagree with that. Actually, the life cycle of these products when, with energy efficiency technologies added means it's much cheaper for people to own and operate them. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Sorensen. You're recognized for five minutes. I want to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member Lofkin for convening this hearing and Secretary Granholm uh, for your willingness to appear for us today. Also, uh, I wish Chairman Lucas a speedy return to our committee. Um, let's talk about science. Uh, I'm not here for the politics. I'm not here for wedge issues. Uh, by training, I was a meteorologist. 
Uh, and so I really appreciate the Department of Energy focusing on the future of clean energy because this is what we're going to leave for our kids and for our grandkids. They're not gonna remember an argument about ceiling fans. They're gonna remember that we did something and we did something for them. Um, I'd like to talk about the um, auto plants for just a minute. Since 2003, the big three automakers have closed or idled 61 plants. In February, Stellantis idled its Jeep plant in Belvedere, Illinois, laying off 1,300 workers in the process. The state of Illinois has been working diligently with Stellantis in an effort to reopen the plant and bring the jobs back. Various presidential administrations have provided loans and grants to auto manufacturing companies that build manufacturing plants here in the United States. However, companies sometimes use those grants and the loans to establish manufacturing presence in so-called right-to-work states, making it less likely that the jobs created through the government investment will be good-paying jobs with robust benefits and worker protections. In fact, hourly wages in right-to-work states are on average 15.8% lower than states like Illinois. And the consumers, they never see this discount. So Secretary, I'm proud owner of an EV built in our country by union workers. What steps can Congress take to ensure that companies receive the federal assistance they need to keep manufacturing in the United States while still incentivizing those priorities and those companies to provide labor standards, high wages, and robust benefits? Thank you for the question. It is uh, top of mind for us uh, as well, especially as we sit on the verge of a potential strike. Um, at the end of last month, uh, it, well, your, your question was, what can Congress do? Continue to support the funding of, um, of conversion grants. So for example, in the inflation uh, in, the Bi in the Inflation Reduction Act, we got a, con I think it was inflation, was it the BIPAR? Yes, it was Inflation Reduction Act. There was the $2 billion for converting existing facilities in, in uh, places that had long been manufacturing. Um, so if a, if a company came, for example, in that Illinois plant you discussed, and there was some uh, entity who wanted to convert it to a facility, that grant would be available to them because they're converting in a place that had high wages and that had been there for a, length, a lengthy period of time. In the same way, our loan programs office is offering another $10 billion for those same purposes. So we are trying to use uh, the funding that we have been given at the department to encourage high wage jobs and conversion of plants uh, in places where the community falls apart if the plant goes away. I know this as former governor of Michigan this is very near and dear to my heart, and so I completely understand what you are what you are saying, and we want to encourage those high wage jobs in places that have historically been making them. So my follow up question is: a lot of this funding goes to the companies versus the states. Is there a way that we can focus it more on the states? to be able to get these companies versus just giving the loan to the, to the company to go somewhere else? Well, I think it would, um, it would require a, a new law, but I would be certainly open to that. Great. Lastly, um, I'd like to talk about the charging infrastructure. Um, even though I, I love driving my Chevy Bolt uh, around the district, I still yet can't advocate for people to buy one. I can't get across the district because in Peoria, Illinois, uh, we don't have DC charging stations. I've talked with the Department of Transportation. What efforts are the DOT and the DOE doing together to facilitate this infrastructure so that we can get people on the road? Great, we have a joint, uh, joint office uh, with the DOT uh, and the DOE, and that office is administering the National uh, Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure grants to the states across Illinois got its grant. Um, I'm happy to say that the funding for the states in three tranches has already gone out. Number one, the tranche is to make sure that there is a charging station on, on transportation corridors within 50 miles of one another and not more than a mile off that transportation hi uh, highway. The second tranche went to urban, to urban areas that may not have, or ur areas in the state that may not have charging infrastructure rural areas, urban areas where there may not be a large penetration yet of electric vehicles to solve the chicken and egg issue. And the third round went to go uh, to states to replace the charging stations that are broken. 
which there are a lot. And under the grant pro program, you have to have charging stations that are up 98% of the time. So that's a requirement, app enabled. And so all of that is happening. Now, states, 20 states have already put out their request for proposals. I can't say, I don't know whether Illinois is one of them, but you can always check. Um, and we hope that 20 more will be by the end of the year. So you should start to see additional charging stations be populated by the end of this year to, so that you can fully recommend people to be able to Great. get. Great, you got it, I can't wait. For the people and for our kids, thanks for your hard work and I yield back, thanks. Gentleman yields back, we'll hear next from the gentlewoman from uh, New York, Ms. Tenney, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Overnolte, and thank you for having this meeting, and, and thank you, Secretary Granholm, uh, for being here. And uh, I'm going to get into a topic which I know that's not going to be popular, but I, I think it's really important. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert four articles into the record detailing Secretary Granholm's various ethics issues and two articles from the Department of Energy's website concerning its ethical policies. First, without, I just want to... Without exception. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an article from Reuters. Uh, U.S. Secretary, uh, Energy Secretary Granholm violated ethics laws, Watchdog says. An article from CNN, Biden touts electric car company potentially worth millions for his energy secretary. Uh, from Washington Free Beacon, Energy Secretary's husband held stock in Ford as administration approved billions in electric vehicle subsidies. Next article from Fox News, Biden Energy Secretary Granholm admits false testimony about owning stocks. The next I want to just point out and, and put these for the record, Mr. Mr. Chair, just so people have them. These are ethics, 14 principles of ethical conduct for federal employees. That's right on the Energy uh, website. Ethics, impartiality in por performing official duties. Uh, want to be sure that- objection. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So since taking office, I know uh, Secretary, or uh, my colleague, Mr. Iser referred to some of these issues, but since taking office in January of 2021, Secretary Granholm has violated the Hatch Act multiple times. She's owned Proterra stock while her boss, President Biden, repeatedly promoted the company. We saw this huge payout. Uh, she admitted three months after she took office. Her husband owned Ford stock while she personally promoted the company's work with official resources, and she cashed in on millions of dollars after these illegal transactions and failure to disclose obvious conflicts, conflicts were revealed. As you said, you, it took you uh, three months before you actually sold the stock. And most critically, she lied under oath to Congress, claiming she did not own any individual stocks when in fact she did. Anyone disputing these charges could consult to these articles that I've put in the record. They're available for everyone. And uh, I just wanna go to uh, Madam Secretary, the DOE's ethical rules, uh, or federal, generally federal employee ethics laws, provide that, quote, public service is a public trust. Employees must place loyalty to the Constitution, the laws, and ethical principles above gain, as I cited in the ethical principles that are part of your own department. Do you believe that any Department of Energy or other federal employee violating this rule should resign or be removed from office for this position? First of all, let me say that we take ethics. That's a yes very, or no question. Do you think if someone violates very, the ethical laws set forth in this, that you took, you said you signed a statement, uh, an ethical statement that you would comply with the laws, do you think that a DOE employee or other federal employee who violates these laws should step down from that position? Is that that's a yes or no? If they violate the ethics laws, I set understand forth, what you're need. trying to do. Well, here. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking trying, you a specific let, no, question. Okay, you have, so you're not going to you answer made the question. A number of allegations that I feel I, I put against me I mean, personally. This is that my I, time, Mr. I, I know, Mr. Chairman. But you've um, made these out there, and I feel it let is me important just, to respond. Let me respond. just tell you, this is what you you uh, you did not answer the yes or no question. You obviously believe that it's okay to violate the ethics rules. Of course, I done. do not believe it's but let's, okay let's to violate ethics laws. It, nor does anyone else in the right. Department so, of Energy. This is my time. So, what you're trying to say is afterwards, once I realized and I spoke to Congress that I was not telling the truth about what was happening, I went back and admitted, oh, I made a mistake. So, admitting the truth after being caught lying doesn't actually cure perjury. I don't know if you know that legally. I know you're an attorney. So you've admitted to testifying falsely and then came back and said, I corrected it later. But that doesn't cure the fact that you actually committed perjury. We've actually impeached presidents uh, over committing perjury. And this is actually in, involved in your, in your official duties. 
also after signing an ethics uh, oath that you said that you signed and admitted to today, and on top of admitting that it was three months after you took office that you actually sold the stock on the private market, as, as Daryl, uh, uh, Congressman Issa put out. So to me, that's perjury, and that's simple. That's, that's perjury, period. Why should you not resign, or why should we not consider uh, some kind of impeachment inquiry into you for your perjury charges? We've done that with presidents of the United States in the past. Number one, I made a mistake when I testified saying that I had sold all stock. I honestly so, thought we had. So wait, but I was so, wrong. so I'll reclaim my so, time. You're a lawyer. You know that perjury. You cannot you go back and say I made a mistake. Perjury exists when you give a false statement under oath, which you did. Oh, did you not? No, I did not intentionally. I thought we had divested of all stocks. We had divested Look, this of is, all. Look, this is the colossal ego stocks. of this administration that people in the American people are frustrated with. You serve the American people. You don't serve President Biden. You don't serve a special interest. You serve the American people. Of and course. We would appreciate you coming forward on this. I am coming forward if you would let me explain. Uh, Look, I appointees with lesser conflicts, honestly, would have withdrawn their nomination or they would resign from office. Thank you. I yield back my There's mind. no conflict. The OIG has investigated the Proterra issue uh, and determined that there was no gentlewoman conflict. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, we'll go next to the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Salinas. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the chair and ranking member for holding this hearing today. And like my colleague from Illinois, I too am not here for the politics, but I do believe we need to set the record straight. This is the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and facts are really important. So Secretary Granholm, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I think we've taken up way too much time, but um, and I do have some important questions to ask around gas prices. You've been asked repeatedly about your connection to Proterra with a lot of conjecture and speculation thrown in for good measure. But let's, again, understand the facts before we go any further. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter sent by the Inspector General of the Department of Energy from um, actually the Trump administration on August 11th, 2021, Ms. Terry Donaldson, to Senator John Barrasso on, on August 11th. In the letter, the Inspector General Donaldson responds to a request from the Senator to scrutinize, and in quote, Secretary Granholm's financial interest in Proterra. The Inspector General's findings were definitive, and I quote, Secretary Granholm publicly disclosed her interests in and position with Proterra. She complied with the terms of an ethics agreement designed to prevent violations of ethical restrictions while serving as secretary. Our inquiries did not identify evidence that Secretary Granholm violated existing statutes or regulations with respect to her financial interest in Proterra. We found no evidence indicating Secretary Granholm worked on specific issues related to Proterra at the same time she owned options for or shares of Proterra. Those findings, and that end quote, those findings remain true today. In fact, the department confirmed to committee staff that DOE has not directed any funding to Proterra during Secretary Granholm's tenure. These are the facts. And so, Secretary Granholm, I will only um, ask you one question on this issue before we move to more important matters. Can you assure us once again that you have complied with all legal and ethical obligations in regards to Proterra as the DOE Inspector General determined? in 2021. I can assure you. Thank you. And now to a question that is um, important to my district. Diesel and jet fuel prices have climbed even faster than other fuels. And these heavy fuels are more easily refined from Russian and Middle Eastern crude than US shale, making them even more susceptible to international pressures. Since July, gas, as you know, is up nine cents at the pump, but diesel prices have risen 48 cents in that same amount of time. In Oregon, we have companies such as Next Clean Fuels, um, which are planning large new biofuel facilities to produce renewable diesel and jet fuels. However, these facilities take time to build, and my constituents are facing high costs right now. Can you provide an update on DOE support for biofuel infrastructure and the steps that we can take to bring these fuels to market more rapidly and further reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Yeah, thank you so much for this question as well, because um, obviously, the infrastructure is important and the fuel itself is important. So we have a whole strategy on biofuels, uh, especially as it relates to um, 
making sure that people are aware of, for example, sustainable aviation fuels and the tax credits associated with those, making sure that we have got infrastructure that um, is not contributing to the cost and that infrastructure, whether it's refinery uh, infrastructure or the uses of diesel itself inside of vehicles. Uh, we want to make sure we have engines uh, and biofuel, um, a biofuel pipeline for, uh, that is lower cost. We've been working on both the transportation side as well as the infrastructure side for a, a long time, and we will continue to do so, but it has been propelled uh, significantly by the incentives associated with the Inflation Reduction Act, and we're very grateful for that. And so um, dovetailing off the, of that, the USDA has also traditionally provided significant support for biofuel research and development. And as you roll out some of these programs from IIJA and IRA, how are you coordinating with agencies like the US Department of Agriculture to maximize the impact of these investments? Yeah, we, have a, we, we definitely work with the uh, Department of Agriculture on this, especially, I mean, they're, they're, they have been, uh, they've got a series of funds that they have been supportive of biofuel development, um, whether it's refineries, uh, making sure that we have the supply associated with the feedstock. Uh, and, and so we do, we, we have worked together with uh, the Department of Agriculture very closely. We've also got, as far as our own uh, strategy, I just wanna turn here. Um, you know, we have, um, a, we have an earth shot that is associated with this called clean fuels and products where we want to make sure that we are taking feedstocks that are not, uh, you know, that are all kinds of feedstocks to be able to reduce greenhouse gases. We've got a whole uh, series of pieces of infrastructure, like at the Idaho National Lab, to be able to do that. Uh, it's called BUFNUF, uh, the biofuel, um, it's a biofuel, um, uh, um, national biofuel, uh, I can't remember the acronym, but bottom line is it's a facility that is, um, uh, an applied strategy on how you can have distributed um, biofuel creation from various sources of feedstock. Um, and we've got biofuel uh, resource centers, four of them across the country, to be able to continue the research on biofuels. So there's a strategy from the Sustainable uh, Aviation Fuel Grand Challenge to the Inflation Reduction Act to the Earth Shots of Clean Fuels to the biofuel uh, um, uh, centers and to the labs, uh, all as part of a continuum uh, to be able to lower the cost and create more supply of biofuels. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Franklin. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here today. Um, just, just a few questions, and, and, and I honestly, my, this is not designed to be a political gotcha. It's just a reality of the world we live in today, but, um, and also because a lot of times, you know, the press gets things different ways. I would like to hear from you, and, and I apologize if I missed it while I was out at another hearing, but can you attest to the validity or the veracity of the, the situation you had a few months ago with the trip where you had a staffer that parked in a charging spot to hold the position for you so that you and your entourage could recharge your vehicles? Was that, was that situation true? Yeah, I've seen the reports. Uh, well, you were there. I mean, what, well, regardless of the report. I wasn't saving the spot. But, um, but let me just say I have a, a fantastic young staff. Just fantastic. Well, that's that's neither well, here nor there. I but, just want to but, say but that somebody made a mistake. Is it true that you had a staffer I didn't, in a gas-powered I, it one, is one true of that your gas, that representatives is, parked in an electric charging spot to reserve the position for you so that you could do it and not be deterred from your travels? Was it that, was, is that it accurate? It was poor judgment on but it's the true, part correct? of the team. Why do you think? And poor judgment, but why do you think they did that? Um, I can only imagine they wanted to continue moving, but the bottom line is it's not going to happen again. Okay. Well, it is interesting that that would happen. I would tell you, I. I don't have personally have an issue with electric vehicles. I think, you know, Teslas are kind of fun. I've enjoyed, you know, as a former carrier pilot, I like the acceleration you get from those. But the reality where I live in Florida, there's not an infrastructure that supports that. But I happened to be in California a week before last. I uh, went to rent my car, go out in the garage, and they tell me you can choose from any vehicle that's out there, pick what you want to drive away. And the only vehicles that were there were electric. And I went and asked the lady, I, I said, is this all you guys have in your vehicle fleet? She goes, no, actually, we have combustion cars too, but those have all been chosen. Because not surprisingly to me, 
people would rather use something that they're familiar with and something they know that they can get charged up pretty easily. I was there for a day. I had back-to-back -back meetings the whole time, no time built into my schedule. I wish I had a staffer who could have parked a car in, in a spot and blocked a, a station for me. But, you know, all these vehicles were charged. The most charged one I saw was 85%. You have to return the vehicle at more than 70%. So somewhere along the way in my 24 hours that I'm in California, I've got to go find a charging station. I asked about that and was told, well, you know, there's apps for that. You can go online and find out where to go charge it. The technology is not there to support what this administration is doing. But just, you know, to, to further bolster that a little bit, uh, you know, California now likes to fancy themselves as a leader in the country, but God forbid the rest of the country follow their way. But by 2035, or you know, we're going to have 100% electric vehicles. That's 68% by 2030. Uh, by 2026, it's going to be 35%. But the reality today, China produces 90 of the batteries that are required for these. China produces 95% of the manganese, 70% of the cobalt and graphite, 66% 60, of the lithium, and 60% of the nickel. Um, the undersecretary of state, um, Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Jose Fernandez, had said, in order to meet the goals that we're going to have to do uh, to achieve these targets, we're going to have to increase our production of critical minerals by six to eight times, uh, the amount of lithium production by 42 times, and the amount of graphite by 25 times. With the hurdles we have with regulations to try to get that stuff permitted and done, it's never going to happen. And everybody knows that. And we, we see, we read stories of the Western auto manufacturers are concerned that this, these policies are driving auto manufacturing into the arms of the Chinese. It's a reality. They're out ahead of this on us. Good, good on them for that. But the truth is, and, and, and we all know it, that we, we do not have the ability to meet these timelines. So I, I'd like to hear from you, what is the game plan to marry up our regulatory environment with the, with the requirements that are coming down the line to, so that give me some confidence that these are, dead, these are deadlines that will be made. Because, yeah. Well, and, and just with one other point, the average used vehicle, the average age of a vehicle on the road now is 12 and a half years. So vehicles that are, you know, folks in California uh, in just a few years aren't going to be able to drive the cars that are being produced today. I mean, they'll be able to drive them, but as we know, as more of these corners that currently have gasoline available to them are converted to charging stations, it's going to get harder and harder to find uh, fossil fuel to refuel the vehicles. But help, help assure me that you got a plan that we're not going to drive auto manufacturing into the arms of the Chinese. Yeah, this is exactly what the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law are all about, which is to create and pull the full supply chain for manufacturing electric vehicles into the United States. And what we're seeing across the country is that it's happening. We've got all these battery manufacturers now in the United States, the supply chain moving to the United States. You're right about extraction of critical minerals. But excuse me, is, is that a clean? Is that clean? Because, yeah. because yeah. the data that I see would indicate that, that really all you're doing is shifting the pollution from one source to another. I mean, yes, you're going to cut ultimately the carbon emissions coming out of, from those electric vehicles, but the production of those batteries, the disposal of them, is absolutely as dirty as anything that's coming out of the tailpipes of these combustion engine cars today. Well, do you disagree with that? Yeah, I do. I do, because there is a whole overall strategy to make sure that these are uh, industrial facilities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that they're built to have lower e uh, GHG emissions. And we want to make sure that we are responsibly extracting uh, minerals as well. We obviously want to partner with our allies. We want to recycle as much as we can. We want to find substitute materials. What we also want to do is sustainable extraction. We have an old mining law. I think it needs to be uh, upgraded for the moment, and hopefully we can do that I, in I a bipartisan love, way. Pardon me. I know we're, we're running short of time, and I'm actually over, but I would love to hear more on the plan on how you intend to work with EPA on that. But I would tell you in Florida, where electric vehicles explode, catch on fire when they get wet, we have hurricanes. You cannot get out of, her, of, of Florida when a hurricane's bearing down an electric vehicle now. It simply is not possible. It just it doesn't exist, and we can show you the data. It may work somewhere else, but it's not going to work in Florida anytime soon. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Fushi. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Lofgren for holding this committee hearing today. And thank you, Secretary Granholm, for your testimony and for appearing before us this morning. I am proud that my district, North Carolina's fourth, includes the Triangle University's nuclear laboratory or tunnel, um, a DOE center of excellence and partnership between UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, North Carolina Central University, and North Carolina State University. 
In fact, about 8% of all PhDs in experimental nuclear physics are educated at Tunnel. And I was pleased to see that North Carolina Central University and HBCU was recently awarded funding through DOE's Reaching a New Energy Sciences Workforce, or known as RENEW, the initiative and effort from the DOE Office of Science to support undergraduate and graduate training opportunities at institutions historically underrepresented in the Office of Science Research Portfolio. This opportunity will allow students in my district and at nearby regional HBCUs and minority serving institutions to participate in accelerated physics research and to be mentored by world-class tunnel faculty. It will also support nearby Durham Technical Community College instructors and students to take part in summer research. These efforts greatly expand the reach of experimental nuclear physics research to communities who are not usually represented, and I applaud DOE's efforts through RENEW and other programs. Secretary Granholm, in your testimony, you noted that DOE's mission requires effective stewardship and promotion of diverse and inclusive research environments and workplaces. With efforts like DOE's Renew Initiative, can you please elaborate on what you consider the agency's roles and responsibilities to be in addressing our nation's workforce needs? You bet. Thank you so much for the question. Um, we are not successful as a nation if we do not make sure that we reach into all talent from all pockets, especially places where we haven't been able to uh, allow great talent to flourish. So Renew and the other workforce uh, strategies that we have been engaged in really are intentional and uh, focused in reaching out to disadvantaged communities to make sure that children there see what it's like to work in a lab, to be able to have hands-on experience. Um, I, I note, for example, um, SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab. They have a program where they uh, reach into a disadvantaged community nearby and get um, girls in high school who never were thinking about being involved in STEM, invite them in for a summer program. And once they're there for the summer, 98% of them chose a STEM degree for college because they just needed to be exposed to it. And so we are a, a better society when we uh, make sure that we have access to all talent. And that is one piece of the important part of workforce development that our labs and the department is doing. How could the lack of fully funding your budget requests for the Office of Science impact programs like Renew's initiative and our nation's ability to address our most pressing problems? Well, clearly um, cuts to what we have uh, requested would hamper um, research, workforce development, uh, deployment, you name it across the board. We uh, think it's very important as we think to the future, and that's what this committee is all about, is thinking about how we can ensure that we have workforce as well as science and technology um, discoveries made. And you know, cutting funding at this moment would hamper our ability to be competitive globally. Um, let's talk about cybersecurity for a moment. In May, the OIG released a report on DOE's unclassified cybersecurity program and found that the department had not taken appropriate actions to address previously identified weaknesses related to its cybersecurity program. 38 of 61 of the OIG's prior recommendations remained open and unaddressed. And in June, DOE informed Congress that it had been affected by the Move It Cyber incident. Can you please tell us if the department is implementing the OIG cybersecurity recommendations now? Um, how so, and what the department is doing to ensure it is protected from future cyber vulnerabilities. Yeah, um, cybersecurity is a high priority, obviously, for the department and the energy sector. Um, we, I know DOE, the DOE IG released its annual Federal uh, Information Security Moderniz Act, Modernization Act uh, evaluation. Um, with every audit, the report included multiple findings across the enterprise that identify areas for improvement. It also, we note, uh, realized a 40% reduction in the number of recommendations from 21 to 22. 
Uh, and we're taking those findings seriously. We're uh, committed to resolving the open uh, issues using a risk-based approach, and we're going to track through and remediate all of the findings in a timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you back? Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Granholm, energy security is national security, and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a national security asset. Would you agree? Yes. Um, why then did you discuss the release of our Strategic Petroleum uh, Reserve with senior Chinese Communist Party officials? I discussed the release of their Strategic Petroleum Reserve, not ours. Do you think that was a good move? It was part of an um, international energy agency effort to get a number of countries to release from their strategic petroleum reserves to create more supply in the market uh, in the wake of uh, supply crunch globally. Do you believe this jeopardized national security of no. America? No. Okay. Is it safe to assume that you consult the CCP officials before major policy decisions? If so, how often do you discuss American energy policy details with them? Absolutely not. How often, uh, what about Russia, Iran, or North Korea? Are you also consul uh, consulted as part of your decision-making process? Do you consult with them? Absolutely not. In March of this year, you released a statement uh, on, the pre uh, on the President's fiscal 2024 budget. In this document, you claim that the Biden administration is increasing America's energy and national security by building out reliable domestic supply uh, chains free of influence from adversarial foreign nations like Russia. China is not mentioned once in this, uh, uh, this public-facing document. Does this Department of Energy not believe that China is a threat to America's energy and national security? Uh, we do. As part of the Biden administration's plan to reduce emissions, the DOE has led uh, efforts to accelerate the broad adoption of electric vehicles across the United States. This so-called revolution is dependent on our main adversary, China. They, don't, uh, they control over 60% of the worldwide production of critical minerals and 85% of the global uh, processing capacity. What is the administration's view on mining of critical minerals right here in America? Uh, we support sustainable mining, and we want to bring that full supply chain here, and that's what the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law are all about, bringing supply chains home. What role should the National Energy Technology Laboratory uh, have to do, uh, uh, have in advancing R&D and critical minerals? They have an important role. The President's FY24 budget uh, proposes a reduction in funding for quantum information science and technology. China has demonstrated secure quantum communications and uh, is currently develop developing a quantum communication satellite network. Can you explain why the Biden administration is reducing funding in quantum information science and technology? What is the, uh, that is uh, vital in sustaining America's global competitiveness and innovation? I'm not aware that we are reducing quantum. I can assure you we are. Uh, in fact, we've asked for investment in, we have five, DOE does, national uh, quantum research centers with an estimated annual budget each of 25 million. That is uh, being retained, and we believe that quantum is an imp a very large part of, uh, I just want to look to see if I can find the numbers of what we must be investing in going forward. So we agree on that. Just looking to see if I can find the number. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentlewoman from Florida, I'm sorry, Colorado, Ms. Caraveo. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to you and Ranking Member Lofgren for holding this hearing. Um, I also wish to extend my hopes for a speedy recovery for Chairman uh, Lucas. Um, and uh, thank you, Secretary Grant for, Holm, for coming to speak with us today. Uh, before I dive into my questions, I just wanted to express support for Colorado's bid with our neighbors in New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming to establish a West 
Western Interstate um, Hydrogen Hub. This is a group of states that is looking to participate in the Regional Clean Hydrogen Hubs program, and I hope that we can stay connected as the department continues to review applications for this program that was made available by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now, uh, you know, one of the things that I love about Colorado is its um, interesting weather patterns, but late last year, Colorado experienced a sudden cold snap uh, when temperatures dropped 37 degrees in one hour, uh, one of the largest one-day uh, temperature changes ever recorded by the National Weather Service. The already cold weather combined with that temperature drop uh, caused Suncor, which is our only uh, refinery in Colorado, to experience an emergency shutdown which then led to a domino effect uh, in my district. Because Suncor is um, uh, really only started coming back online months later in March, my constituents were hit with high cost as the gas uh, prices jumped about 50% um, in Colorado. And then it didn't just stop there because uh, there were reports of multiple emission leaks well above regulated levels during the shutdown of Suncor. Uh, as a pediatrician myself who has seen children with increased symptoms of asthma whenever there are similar emissions, uh, this was incredibly concerning. Uh, the Sun Core shutdown, I think, really demonstrated to Coloradans how climate change can have an impact both on their pocketbooks and their physical health. And that's why I think we need to make sure our en energy infrastructure, no matter what fuel we'll, we're looking at, is resilient to extreme weather events, which we have talked about are increasing uh, caused because of uh, climate change. So, um, Secretary, what gaps do you think exist in our current climate resistance research as it relates both to gas refineries and renewable energy facilities. Yeah, great. Thank you. I think on the refinery side, um, in terms of resilience for weather events, the traditional mechanisms uh, apply, like insulation, et cetera. And I think the question is always, what's the cost benefit given the frequency of the events? But as we are seeing greater frequency, it is imperative that these facilities invest in, you know, whether it is flood management or water management, conservation. On the second part, or on renewables, but also on refineries, we have done an industrial decarbonization roadmap, which includes uh, uh, refineries and petroleum refineries in particular, but also uh, all industries, heavy industries, which lays out the specific um, R&D steps that are next for them to, to decarbonize. Um, you know, research is gonna be development for, you know, research and development is gonna be necessary for low um, capital solutions like energy and materials and systems efficiency, but also, um, you know, reducing fugitive methane, uh, pursuing zero, hydrogen um, strategies, presume, you know, all of the carbon capture, all of the ways that the industrial facilities overall can decarbonize. I'm happy to send you a copy of that so you can see the um, multi, I mean, it's a, it's a longish document, but there's a section there that refers specifically to uh, refining. Uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Very interested in uh, your work in the area. Uh, what role um, uh, does Congress need to play in this so that we can be supportive of the work um, that you're doing to pr protect constituents, both from high prices and from health consequences yeah, as we I mean, see more of these events? Excuse me. I'm sorry. The, uh, obviously, Congress uh, can continue to authorize and appropriate funding so that we can ensure that these facilities have the means to be able to install the resiliency measures that they need to be able to uh, continue to function. Well, happy to continue working yeah, with the department um, on that um, as we see these events, like uh, we have both said, um, increase. And thank you very much uh, for your work and for uh, your testimony today. Thank and with that, I will yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. We will go next to the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Williams, and the chair of the Energy Subcommittee. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, there's so much I love about your department and the interaction that I've had uh, with your people at the National Energy Labs. Um, this is an area of particular interest for me, as you and I discussed briefly, and uh, I just commend you for so many of the wonderful people that uh, I've had the privilege to meet and interact with. Um, bear with me, but uh, we're, we're, there will be questions. Uh, but my concern is for the rapidly rising cost of energy for the constituents in my district in central New York, we pay an average of 51% more than the national average for electricity, yet um, there's even move for even higher costs to be passed on to consumers because of projects like offshore wind and uh, solar farms that require 
additional investment of backup sources to make them uh, actually um, usable. As one of my colleagues across the aisle has pointed out, uh, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, and sometimes it snows a lot and covers up everything. So um, this is having a, a very difficult uh, effect, of, uh, I think an unfair effect on the 63% of Americans that live paycheck to paycheck. Um, energy cost is uh, literally impoverishing uh, working American, um, Americans. Another issue, though, is the resilience of our energy grid, and it seems more precarious than any time in my lifetime, and I've, I've spent some time talking with uh, many of your scientists about this uh, issue, um, but the, uh, my question for you, in line of question, is really about rebalancing our investment in energy infrastructure. You may have known recently that uh, Europe learned a very painful lesson in this regard with the invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia and their over-reliance, Europe's over-reliance on renewables and over-investment in renewables caused enormous pain uh, as factories had to shut down, potentially putting people out of work. Uh, it happened to come in the winter, which uh, was unseasonably mild, thank God, but uh, heating costs rose significantly. And one of the wonderful things that came out of it is that the EU actually discovered two new green technologies for energy. Uh, remarkable, it was uh, nuclear and natural gas. And so um, in this country, we don't seem to have learned anything from this very uh, visible and very large scale uh, reality check on our investment in renewable power. In April, Goldman Sachs estimated that we would spend, America would spend $6.6 .6 trillion on renewables. And I'm not talking about clean energy, I'm talking about on renewables. And um, meanwhile, I noticed that we're spending a billion dollars on fusion. I'm very excited about that and the work that you're doing on that. Um, we're spending, your, your department's investing um, you know, multiple billions of dollars in advanced nuclear and the supply chain and uranium enrichment, all these great things. But 6,600 billion invested in renewables, one billion in fusion, or several billion perhaps in advanced nuclear, which is my expertise. This country needs at least 200 gigawatts of new power generation capacity. Um, and I have been told that for just one quarter of the investment that we would make in uh, renewables, this 6.6 .6 trillion, less than a quarter of that, if we spent that on nuclear and natural gas, we would actually have low costs, low emissions energy for generations. I'm curious, um, why is it that we are so unbalanced in the face of the reality of what we've seen in Europe in the energy investments we're making in this country? So um, I think we need it all. I think we need the investment uh, in nuclear. All, I think all the need... above, I agree, but it has to be balanced in well, investment, wouldn't you agree? Here's what I would say is that, um, you know, we follow where the private sector is going as well, and there's a huge amount of investment in renewables. That is true. Um, the, it's led by incentives by your by, by the administration. It's yes, it's a distortion as it, as of the as market. As much of energy is uh, there's incentives across the board, but, the, but huge but distortion say, in the market. The great news is that in most places, solar and wind are now the cheapest forms of energy. So now we have to work on on Th then why wouldn't we limit storage. why wouldn't we limit wind and solar investment to those places where they are economically viable because instead of in the Adirondacks where it snows. Syracuse is the second cloudiest city in America. Yeah, as, as, as we know, um, we want to take this to scale. And we're not going to prohibit a university or anywhere else from investing in these technologies. But also, we're, we know that advances in these technologies allow them to be effective in many places where 10 years ago they were not. I, I'm, I am 100% in favor of uh, increasing power density in solar, increasing um, the wonderful innovation that you're that your department's doing in battery technology, for example. Um, we have distorted the market in a way that's dangerous for our grid and is punishing to the working class of America. 
I invite a conversation with you, a dialogue with you on how we can rebalance this. Um, if your office would be interested, I would certainly be available to that. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, thanks. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Lee. You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, I know that this is not usually how this happens, but uh, the gentlewoman from uh, Virginia asked if she can hop ahead of me. Certainly without objection. Uh, we'll hear from the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Virginia. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Laughran uh, for planning this hearing. And thank you, uh, Secretary Granholm, for your work to ensure that the U.S. is a leader in uh, energy innovation and the clean energy transition. Uh, as a state legislator, I uh, carried the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which put Virginia on a path to 100 percent clean energy by uh, by 2050, and I look forward to working with you and the Biden-Harris administration in implementing the historic investments in that clean energy transition so we can hopefully speed up that timeline. Um, but my questions today are more focused on my concerns around the impact a government shutdown could have on um, our, our research abilities, that a shutdown could jeopardize uh, access to essential federal services um, and have a harmful economic impacts, um, but would also, in some cases, irreparably harm our, our research capabilities. Um, the previous shutdown in 2019 disrupted the flow of federal science funding, forced researchers to put their work on hold, interrupted time-sensitive studies, and due to the nature of scientific research, some of those losses were impossible to recover. As a matter of fact, just this morning, um, I received an email from a major uh, research university in my district, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, that said, DOE projects that are waiting for the next budget period funding will be shut down temporarily if there's a government shutdown. And to start them back up is not that easy, as it will cause additional expenses and delays, students and postdocs could be laid off, and to find them back with the same skill level uh, would be very difficult. And so I wanted to ask if you could further address how a government shutdown would impact the Department of Energy's ability to carry out its science and technology mission, both in the short term, but also in the long term. Um, thank you for the question and for your leadership in uh, this clean energy space. Um, obviously, a shutdown would be um, terrible in many, many ways. But let me say this. Um, our position is that the debt ceiling uh, vote was a deal to fund the government at a certain level. And we expect the speaker to deliver on that deal. And we know that with the end of the fiscal year approaching, it's clear that we're gonna need some kind of short-term uh, continuing resolution to provide more time for the uh, FY24 appropriations process to unfold. And we look forward to working with both sides to achieve that deal. Me too. Um, but could you also address the impact that a long-term continuing resolution or automatic spending cuts could have on the DOE's ability to carry out its, its uh, research? Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, um, a cut that prevents scientists from being able to do their research in any of the areas that we have discussed, a cut that requires facilities to be shut down, like user facilities, for example, where you've got wait lists of entities waiting to do fundamental research. These are not, these are not facilities that you can just flip on a dime. These are not on-off switches. These are massive uh, facilities. And the, the scientific work that's being done and the research that is being done, um, it must continue. So it would harm. Uh, in the immediate, and it would harm our ability. I uh, re 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 go back to this globally. We are we are in a race on all of these technologies, and to slow it, to stop it, is going to impede our ability to be competitive and to lead. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, and earlier this year, I was pleased to see the Department of Energy's announcement of the HBCU Clean Energy Education Prize. Uh, which supports HBCUs in developing STEM programming for K-12 and community college students and is part of uh, the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 commitment 
Um, I wonder if you could give us an update on the program, either quickly in an answer or uh, on the record later, later uh, an update on this program and other initiatives you're pursuing to increase equity in our clean energy future. Yeah, happy to provide you with something additional, but just quickly on May 8th, uh, we announced this uh, first uh, version of the prize, the uh, Clean Energy Education Prize, and since the launch, uh, we've la we're launching a second version uh, of that as well, and I will get you the details in writing both on that as well as the other work that we're doing on Justice 40. Thank you, Madam yep. Secretary, and I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Keene. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, for being here, uh, Secretary Granholm. Um, my question is on uh, nuclear energy. And uh, as you know, it's the most reliable and resilient form of, of electricity in many ways. And in fact, on your website uh, at the Department of Energy, it, uh, it says that nuclear power is the most reliable energy source, and it's not even close. Uh, the question that, uh, with that in mind, uh, in, in New Jersey, uh, we have, you know, our nuclear power plants uh, produce about 40 percent of the electricity and accounts for more than 85 percent of the carbon-free power. Uh, given the success of this, of this uh, industry and energy source so far, uh, can you talk to me why you are looking to seek a decrease of 11 percent, $210 million for the Office of Nuclear Energy? Yeah, the only reason why you see a reduction there is that the demonstration projects were moved over to a different part of the department, to the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. So it wasn't a reduction in the amount of money that we're spending uh, on nuclear in general. It was just the office, in fact, it was by law that we moved it over to the demonstration side of the equation. Okay. And so would that include the, uh, the versatile tool, excuse me, the versatile tool test reactor? Um, the versatile test reactor was not funded uh, last time, and so it, by Congress uh, they chose not to fund it. Mm -hmm. And so, this is a this is a really important question because we need to have a test reactor, right. um, and I'm hoping that in the next couple of years we can get back to funding it, and that people will see the importance of having a test facility for reactors. Can, uh, can you funded. talk about that a little bit more here? please, about the importance of it? It, it is very important because you, if you don't have a facility to test, mm -hmm. uh, then you're not sure that the next generation of reactors are going to be safe, are going to be effective, et cetera. Right. So that test reactor and the test bed that was uh, you know, set aside for this, we had been funding. Uh, you know, I know in budget times there's always negotiations, but for, we're hopeful that we can get back to funding it so that we can make it available, especially for all these modular reactors that are coming online. Right. Well, that's the, w one of my points, yeah. is the fact that we're looking at, m many places are looking at nuclear and modular reactors, and they're getting safer and safer, and they're getting able to be uh, reduced and done at, at a scale in which we can have a re resilient and reliable right. energy grid, and it's an important solution. Yes. And, and ensuring that this is as part of a budget, whether it's you know, through the help of Congress and through, with obviously with the support of the administration, I think it's one of the areas we need to be continue to focus on, because there are many uh, countries that are leading in this yeah. effort, and we need to be more aggressive in that regard. I agree. Um, in uh, other areas, can you talk about the importance of uh, public-private uh, partnerships in the future of our energy security and, and innovation in general, and where you see the department's focus? Yeah, I mean, public-private partnerships are everything mm -hmm. um, in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't have government-funded uh, systems. We have public-private partnerships. And so making sure that those uh, pipelines are there, and we at the Department of Energy start with funding, you know, nascent, whether it's at ARPA-E or uh, technology transfer from the laboratories, and then we take them to applied strategies. And then they deploy, and they, uh, the bird starts to fly from the nest, and that's what's really important. If we don't fund those early stage uh, efforts, then we're not going to see the later stage efforts because it's difficult for often um, those with great ideas to get the funding to be able to do that. So that's why those public-private partnerships are, are completely necessary. And even for some of the initial large-scale demonstration projects, so for example, the hydrogen hubs will require a 50 percent uh, contribution. Uh, we're not funding at all. It has to be a partnership. Yeah. So it de-risks uh, the public-private partnership with government funding, but eventually you want to make sure that the private sector can run with it. Yeah. 
No, no, I agree. And if I, I can help in that regard, let me know. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we'll go back to the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania. Ms. Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Granholm, for honoring this committee's invitation to be here today. It's not easy being at the forefront of implementing massive change to shape the future of American energy production and consumption. So we thank you. The economy of Western Pennsylvania has been reinvigorated by the expansion of the technology sector. My district is home to one of three Department of Energy, uh, excuse me, Energy National Energy Technology Laboratory sites, uh, NETL, uh, that will benefit from $150 million in funding through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to improve lab, in lab infrastructure through DOE's Office of Fossil Energies and Carbon Management. Just last week, DOE's Loan Program Office issued a conditional commitment of nearly $400 million to EOS Energy Enterprises Project Amaze, which will bring almost 1,000 uh, green jobs and 50 union construction jobs to my uh, region, the Mon Valley. I'm glad that um, the work of our office ha has done behind the scenes has come to fruition for the benefit of my district in Pennsylvania. I'm interested to hear more about how my district and this region can be further aligned with your agency's priorities towards the development of our nation's renewable and clean energy economy. Every member of this committee represents families who are concerned or affected by the changes they see and feel in their environment. It's vital that we continue to push for new technologies and strategies, not just for energy security, but for better welfare and living standards for our constituents. Um, I fight every day to make sure the people I represent are not left behind in the transition to a new economy. Green jobs can and will be union jobs. Environmental protection and addressing environmental injustices are not mutually exclusive from supporting communities with resources and employment opportunities. So I'm excited to continue working with various offices in your agencies to make uh, those jobs a reality. I'm proud that my bill, the uh, Abandoned Well Remediation Research and Development Act, passed through this committee and will further support research and development to help reduce methane emissions from abandoned mines across the country. Can you tell us how uh, will apply research, development, and demonstration programs prioritize historically disadvantaged and environmental justice communities? Wow, that was great. I'm so glad you're from that area because it's such an important area to demonstrate um, you know, I mean, Pittsburgh, for example, has just been the phoenix that has showed other industrial areas how to do it with smart planning and good strategy and great leadership. And the Mon Valley and steel production and transitioning to clean steel, um, it, is, it is, you can continue that work of being the phoenix that rises from the ashes. So it's very exciting. The um, Justice 40 initiative is about communities that have been disadvantaged and left behind and making sure that in our grant process, we consider in our community benefits plans, communities that have been at the back of the line and that have been forgotten, we want to make sure that they are part of this new energy economy. Um, super excited about EOS, super excited about um, Next Tracker, which is another uh, company that uh, opened up in an old factory, the conversion of these old factories to be able to produce the, the supply chains for the clean energy economy is very exciting. Nearby in Weirton, West Virginia, uh, they have Form Energy, which is on the, the footprint of an old steel factory, and they're doing iron air batteries for long duration energy storage. This area is, um, is going to benefit enormously, and we want to make sure that, the commun that all pieces of the community, but particularly those who have been left behind, yeah have the, be the best advantage. Thank you. I'm very happy that you mentioned the community, a community benefits agreement. EOS, of course, as a part of this grant or a part of uh, their process, it had to implement one. And they spent uh, time very intentionally convening with different communities around their site, community leaders and members, to come up with this. They call this a boon to their company, not the bane of it. I'd love to know how community benefits agreements process carried out by folks like them um, can ensure that tools like, that these tools serve not just as a checklist, right, for entities who seek federal funding, but are indeed mutually benefit, beneficial. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's critical because, um, first of all, if a factory lands in a community and the community was not consulted, then you're not gonna be as successful, not just from a workforce uh, point of view, but just from an acceptance. You're much better off going in 
and having an open table and saying, here's what, how can we construct this? How can we do this in a way that actually benefits uh, the people? That definitely includes workforce. And in an era where we have such low unemployment, this is an opportunity for communities to really own the future, their future, of this clean energy economy. That's why the requirements for grants have a community benefits plan, and 20% of that grant is graded upon the community benefits plan and its quality. And we're requiring that all across the board. Thank you. I had I could go on and on and on. Uh, it was worth it to not get all my questions to hear you call my community the Phoenix. So I'll leave with that, and I yield back my time. Thank you so much. Right, gentleman yields back. Uh, we'll hear next from the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Weber. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I appreciate my colleague not going on and on and on. <laughs> so anyway, hey, listen, I want to correct something, Madam Secretary, that you said for the record. You told Mr. Babin that quote, we are at record levels of production of oil and gas. We're producing more than ever before. We're producing 12.7 million barrels per day or by the end of the year, this year, end quote. The, the research showed that according to the EIA, Energy Information Administration, June of 2023, the U.S. produced 12.84 million barrels of crude oil. This is the highest level of production of oil for this administration, but it isn't the highest production, period. According to the EIA, again, the previous administration, the U.S. produced 13 million barrels of crude oil in November 2019. And being from Texas, where we do a lot of that, I just want to set that straight for the record. I appreciate the job of you being here. Um, I saw the, I saw, I don't know if you saw, uh, the Ford CEO, CEO came out today, Fox News Business, said that uh, electric vehicles are provoking charging anxiety. I don't know if you saw that uh, by chance. I it doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise you that the anxiety was provoked? Yes. Because <laughs> you've been there recently, I know. <laughs> so you, you had the trip. Of course, it made news, obviously. And so um, I think you, you mentioned uh, range anxiety, actually. And, of course, he's calling char it, the Ford CEO is calling it charging anxiety. Um, but you, you went and you had people in front of you and people behind you, and of course, I guess you were supported probably by gas-powered vehicles in some, in some form? Uh, my security detail drives a uh, gas-powered vehicle. Right. You wouldn't want their battery to fail, would you? Well, I, I'd be all about having big, honking gas, uh, electric vehicles uh, of large size. We're, we're on the cusp, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, well, you got a, a ways to go. Um, what about when you did that? I'm just curious because, you know, I own a big F-350 diesel truck Ford. I'm from Texas, after all, and uh, so we drive long distances. Uh, I'm curious, did y'all plan out that route? I guess your staff did. You had a particular route or route, however you want to say, that that you wanted to take. Yeah, we, we decided to do an EV road trip through the south, uh -huh. um, and, um, you know, I, as I was saying earlier, I have a fantastic staff, but an error of judgment was made. The good news is that everybody was able to charge, but it definitely underscored, which we knew it would, that we need more charging stations in this nation. And that's what the North American Vehicle Infrastructure, uh, the Infrastructure Act, the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law gave us $7.5 billion to add 500,000 charging stations across the right. country. And so so you, it's gonna get better. Well, uh, at taxpayer expense, of course, I would argue that when gasoline cars were invented, turn of the century 1900, I wasn't there, I just looked that old. <laughs> but I read in that book where, you know, when they invented the horseless carriage is what it was called, how the government then went out and put gasoline stations everywhere. Oh, wait. No, they didn't. <laughs> so, you're not near that old either, but you might, surely you read that book about the mention of the automobile. I, I am familiar with the start of the automobile industry, having been right. the governor of Michigan, yeah. So, and aren't we glad it was gasoline automobile, not electric automobile? We'd really be in the make of a hess. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so let me continue. <laughs> so um, you, you had an error of judgment made. I know you ran into an untimely, unfortunate occurrence where there was a family waiting on, on a, a, a vehicle, a charging station, I should say. Would you agree that before we can really have a huge amount of electric vehicles on the highway, we have got to update our electric grid? Now, I'm from Texas where we have our own electric grid, ERCOT, 85% of the state is in its own electric grid. And Winter Storm Uri, February three years ago coming up, solar panels iced up, windmills failed, and we had a, a problem. And so 
We need base load generation to be the best, most reliable it can be. And I have, to, I have to say that it's going to be either nuclear or natural gas at this point. Does that sound like it's a pretty good bet? I think nuclear is a very good bet. I think we've got an awful lot of natural gas. I just want to, um, with respect, say that I think Winter Storm Uri proved that the natural gas infrastructure was also subject to uh, It was. There's some more pipeline. I'm glad to hear you're in, you're in favor of pipeline permitting uh, updates. I'm glad to hear that. So I was going to ask you what you would tell the American public about that trip, but I'm down to 11 seconds. Unlike my colleague over there, I'm not going to go on and on. So I thank you for being here. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll go next to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Frost. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hello, Madam Secretary. It's great to meet you. The Inflation Reduction Act included $8.8 .8 billion in rebates designed to make American Americans' homes uh, more energy efficient. For Floridians, this could mean a new air conditioner, um, a home solar installation, or even better insulated windows. Um, you know, by this summer, but this summer, uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis vetoed funds to implement those rebate programs in our state, de depriving Floridians of over $340 million in federal funding and ensuring that none of those savings will be heading to my home state or my district. I'll also say I heard one of my colleagues from Florida mention that the infrastructure isn't there in Florida for EVs yet, or he said that the infrastructure isn't there and that the technology isn't there. The technology is there. The infrastructure isn't there in part because our governor refuses to accept funds already appropriated and that are supposed to be meant for our state. And so I put a lot of blame on the Ron DeSantis administration for Florida falling back in terms of technology. Our office has heard from many of my constituents, including seniors on fixed incomes and small business owners who are angry and stunned with the state's decision um, to deprive them of these programs. Many members of the Florida delegation, including myself, sent a letter to your office regarding this. And I wanted to ask, Madam Secretary, will the Department of Education create a, federal manage, a federally managed program to allow local governments and municipalities in places like the state of Florida to access um, these rebates budgeted already in the IRA? Yeah, thanks for this question. It is, um, um, I can't imagine why a state would reject funds that would help their citizens uh, to be able to lower their costs. But um, the law uh, says that the money must go to states and that if a state has until August of 2024 to be able to access that funding. Um, and uh, as it's currently um, uh, regulated, the, if a state does not, that money gets reallocated to other states. So um, I would be uh, eager to see and to sit with you and f our team would figure out if there's uh, another solution. Um, but at this point, states must apply. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, well, it's great to hear that... Um you know, your team and, and, and our team and the members that signed this letter can get together and figure out how we can ensure that this money already budgeted for the state of Florida can be used by Floridians. And I, I can't imagine why the governor decided to reject it too. Maybe it's too woke, I'm not sure. Um, JBT Aerotech has been in Orlando for over 40 years and is now manufacturing electric cargo loading, pushback, and jetway vehicles for airports um, across the entire world, um, but also specifically the United States. It's a company that's in my district. Something they mentioned is ever since the IRA came out, they've seen exponential growth in the amount of um, electric jet bridges, cargo pushing vehicles, pushback vehicles that are being ordered by their clients. I asked you know, if it, how we can up it even more. They said one of the largest problems they've seen with airports is that they don't have the in charging infrastructure set up to take advantage of getting the vehicles. And so they said if that infrastructure gap can be, can be met, then they would see it even more. So I wanted to see, is this type of issue something that the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation was created to address? Well, um, I will say it was created to address the charging, uh, electric vehicle charging gaps along uh, public transportation corridors and mm -hmm. in areas, cities, et cetera, where it doesn't exist right now. Um, however, I do think that if this, is, if this piece of infrastructure gap uh, for airports, for example, um, exists, then I think I would put it back to Congress to say that there might be a way to plus up 
Mm -hmm. uh, this, I mean, the ideal is that we want to create uh, charging everywhere, uh, including a grid that can handle the charging everywhere. Uh, and the uh, charging infrastructure right now is designed to go for individual uh, drivers mm -hmm. um, uh, and to replace the charging infrastructure that's not working. That's what the three tranches are uh, for at the moment. What are some other ways that DOE is working with other agencies to meet the administration's vital goal of net zero emissions by 2050? Oh, we're working all across uh, the government. It is a whole of government approach. We have a cabinet that is focused on this that includes a, a sub-cabinet, which includes the Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, the EPA, um, Treasury. I mean, all of the agencies that have a, have a, a chunk of this, uh, uh, of this very important in commerce. Uh, of this very important part of our, um, you know, of our ecosystem. Um, whether it's making sure that we're doing right on the regulatory side, which is EPA, or doing right on the build out of clean, which is ours, um, or doing right uh, for the agricultural community taking advantage, all of the pieces of government are working in this direction to get to net zero by 2050 and 100% clean electricity on our grid by 2035. Okay. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for your years of service. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and uh, without objection, we are going to take a five-minute break to uh, to allow our stenographer to, uh, to to get a little relief. So uh, we will come back in five minutes. The hearing is called back to order. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, who rushed to get over here, is next for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, and and Madam Secretary, I do appreciate. I do appreciate you getting here because I think energy is such an important aspect that we need to address. And, you know, um, I am concerned, you know, right out of the box, we closed the Keystone Pipeline, and then we've, we've uh, reduced oil and gas leases. Um, uh, we, and the environmental and social issues of concerning, you know, to put that, put that, and then we're talking about EVs and so on. But, but I have to tell you, Madam Secretary, that when I go to just my pickup, and I own farmland and, and so on, but, and my farmer friends, but when I go to fill up my pickup, two years ago it was $50, and now it's $100. Uh, and those dollars that go into that fuel tank, uh, I think could have gone to groceries for some of the people in my district. I mean, you know, they're, they're struggling the way it is. And so, so anyway, Mike, Mike, my concern is that we create so many restrictions and, um, and we get so focused on carbon and so on when our country is doing such a great job of uh, reducing emissions. Uh, and there's probably things that we could do better or cleaner or whatever, but, but then that's, that's con contrasted with China going around the world uh, building fossil fuel power plants, and they're they're capturing resources, and they're capturing civilizations, really. I mean, or or cultures, by being able to do that. So, so, I guess my concern is, uh, how do you see that? How do we counteract what China is doing around the world uh, with with how well we're doing in in efficiency, and how we go from from energy and in, energy dependence. Uh, from our adversaries to go to energy independence. Thank you so much. I think we share a lot of the same concerns. We all um, want to make sure that the United States is leading rather than China, that we're not reliant upon China, and that China's not uh, amassing allies across the globe because of their investments. No doubt about that. It's one of the reasons why what we have seen over the past two years with the amount of investments that have been made in the United States to bring those supply chains home has been really remarkable. In fact, uh, in Indiana, I was just looking, uh, we, we put out today a, a map, an interactive map where you can see the investments that are happening. And in Indiana, you've got 18 uh, companies, supply chain, announcing in this clean energy space that they are coming and hiring people and um, setting up shop, which is great. It's great news. And that's not just Indiana. It's, it's across, uh, across the country, 23 in Texas, uh, sir. So we, it, you know, the bottom line is we've got to continue to bring back investments. We want these products 
made in America, stamped made in America with American workers. And that's the strategy. I think we all think that's a good thing. Um, with and with respect to continuing to be clean, you know, this, there's, uh, it's alleged that by um, uh, Bloomberg uh, that the market for these clean energy products by 2030 globally is going to be about $23 trillion. And the question is, which country is going to corner that market? Well, China has already cornered a piece of it, and we're just trying to get it back. And so we can do nothing right, or we can be aggressive about it. And I think what we are doing and what we're seeing is that the United States is now leading, and that's good news. Well, thank you. And Indiana appreciates uh, any of the efforts in that direction. But I want you to know uh, we're very competitive with Texas, too. So, uh, <laughs> But I thank you for that, that kind of investment and so on. And, um, uh, you know. Gentlemen's time's expired. No, no. <laughs> you got to watch these Texans. I mean, there's a, I really like Texas, though. But anyway. But you know, my background's agriculture, and we take a lot of fuel, and we take a lot of, we've got a lot of machinery dedicated, dedicated to using fossil fuels. And I don't mind looking at alternatives, but, uh, but I'd sure like the, the opportunity to, um, to be able to, to, to move that in in a, in a res reasonable and respectful way. So I guess my time's about up, and my chairman just canceled me out, and so. <laughs> But we got about 18 seconds, if you don't mind commenting about. Agree. Okay. Agree that we have to don't, see this don't as a transition. Anymore. That's good. We're good. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The witness's time has expired. <laughs> <laughs> and so as the gentleman, Congresswoman Ross, you're up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Substitute Chairman, and Mr. Substitute Ranking Member for holding this hearing. And of course, thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for joining us today and for the excellent work you're doing for the people of this country. Um, I'm also appreciative of all the work the Biden administration has done to invest in the clean energy revolution along with Congress. And I would be honored to host you in my district, um, the Research Triangle, to show you the exciting work we're doing in North Carolina. My district is home to a new EV workforce training program at Wake Tech Community College, as well as the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster, a non profit organization that's worked with its partners for over a decade to support efforts to bring new clean tech cl companies to our region and to our state. And this afternoon, I am meeting with nuclear engineering students at NC State University, one of the top ranked universities for nuclear engineering. So all good things. And you can drive there if you want in an electric all vehicle. Right. <laughs> um, I've been pleased to see the rapid investment that re the renew in the renewable energy sector, including wind energy, um, following the passage of the IIJA and the Inflation Redu in Reduction Act. Building out our renewable energy production is key to our clean energy future, but it also required, uh, requires us to solve the complexities that a diverse and diffuse electric grid brings. My home state of North Carolina is no stranger to the dangers that extreme storms like hurricanes pose to our grid, and a diffuse clean energy grid requires even more coordination and, inten and intentional planning than traditional power sources. And I know Representative Bonamici um, opened this discussion at the very beginning, but we simply don't have enough money in the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill to deal with all of the grid needs that we have. And you're gonna have to be partnering with states, particularly for distributed generation, to deal with upgrades for storms. And I'm interested in knowing how you're gonna make this work and how the economics are gonna work. Because FERC has an entirely different way of paying for grid modernization than many of our states. In, in my state of North Carolina, it either is 100% on the rate payers, or if you're a new renewable energy resource, you pay 100% for that interconnect. So what is, um, what is the Department of Energy doing on this front? Thank you for the question. Thanks for your leadership. I look forward to um, coming to North Carolina, to yeah. your district, and seeing all of the great things that are, that are happening. Um, 
we know that the energy system overall in this nation is completely pocketed, right? It's like a mosaic, and it's different in every 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 district, almost depending on the utility and the spread of the jurisdiction. Um, we, you know, the the national grid is really a pocket of fifty state grids and um, and munis and munis and co-ops and et cetera. So. What, is, what can we do to make sure that the grid works together, that people are treated fairly, and that they can take advantage of the lower forms of energy, cost of energy, like renewables coming on? FERC, I know, has a, um, a cost allocation rule that they are contemplating. I hope uh, that passes to sort of even things out. We, but we all share uh, the backbone, which is a grid. And even if it's, you know, we need to make sure that, except for in Texas, which we hope that we eventually have a handshake for, um, Congressman. But, uh, but bottom line is we need to make sure that the grid everywhere is reliable, and we don't have enough funding in this. I mean, as much funding as existed, mm -hmm. there's a $10.5 billion slug for these GRIP awards, which are all about making the grid more resilient. But, um, and we have a grid uh, facilitation uh, funding as well to help build out some of the new, but they're small compared to the need that is out there. So we are going to continue to push on the innovation. We're going to continue to push on resilience. We're going to continue to push on the materials that would make it easier to put more power along a single line, like advanced reconductoring, et cetera. But um, to be able to incentivize the build out of the transmission that we need, uh, we would need Congress to act again. Great, and I know I only have 15 seconds left, Sorry. but um, I will ask you to submit for the record um, what you're doing to deal with cybersecurity issues. I have a bipartisan bill that came through this committee, one of the first bills to pass the House, that would um, create a grant program and Great. more investment in education and working with your department on cybersecurity. And that would with be welcome. Great, thank you so much, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman in Ohio was recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Secretary Granholm, for joining us today. And thank you for your patience. Uh, Madam Secretary, there are a few things on my mind today that I would like to address with you. Uh, I represent an area around Cleveland, Ohio, which is a rich history of steel making. Today, our region is home to Cleveland Cliffs, which I believe you visited, uh, the largest flat rolled steel maker in the United States, headquartered in downtown Cleveland, and with one of its integrated mills within city limits. As you know, American steel producers are the cleanest in the world, cleaner than China, India, and a vast amount of other countries. And our steel producers, like Cliffs, are working to make their operations even cleaner while still remaining competitive. I have heard firsthand from Cliffs that a component of its strategy includes the use of clean hydrogen when it becomes economically viable. As part of that strategy, Cliffs is very invested in the Great Lakes Hydrogen Hub, which has an application pending with DOE. Cliffs and other Northeast Ohio businesses would be major off-takers of this nuclear-based hydrogen hub, and it would make the technology extremely economically viable immediately. Secretary Granholm, I know you have more hub applicants than can be funded, but I also understand decisions may be near. What information can you provide committee members about, one, how the department is approaching these hydrogen hub applications, and two, the timing for the announcement of these awards? Thank you. And I really hope to see that that hub come to Ohio, where it would be an important economic driver for our communities and much needed. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of the decision-making process. Uh, interviews were had. Concept papers have been uh, submitted. There's been a merit review panel uh, that of experts. This is all done on a merit uh, basis. So I'm not involved. It's all experts who rank the hubs. Um, so we expect that there will be an announcement, um, hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, at least within the next month. We want this announcement to um, be in the same ballpark as the Treasury guidelines regarding hydrogen. Not sure if you're familiar, but there's a lot of uh, back and forth about that. Yeah. Uh, today we announced uh, another billion dollars for a demand side strategy for hydrogen so we can make sure that the hydrogen economy works in these hubs. So all of, I would say in the month uh, before the end of October, we'll have answers to uh, all of these, we hope. Okay. Well, 
Thank you for that uh, detailed response, and it's really appreciated, but let's not hope. We want the answers, I <laughs> and I want cliffs to be booming, because it helps our area in Ohio 7, I so understand. thank you very much, Secretary. As you know, DOE and NASA signed a Memorandum of Understanding in October of 2020 to promote collaboration between the two agencies. This MOU highlighted different areas of increased partnership, including the high-performance computing, planetary defense, and space situational awareness, among other areas. Having NASA Glenn Research Center in my district, I would like to know what developments you can point to from the last three years resulting from this MOU. Yeah, um, let me see here. So I know uh, the collaboration, obviously, with NASA is really important to us. Um, you know, we've done space-based uh, nuclear collaboration, uh, very important, uh, and that is to deliver these radioisotope uh, power systems. Um, and I'm going to have to get back to you on the, any updates on the status of that component of the partnership. Um, we, uh, the Office of Science, has been uh, working with NASA through collaborative uh, pro uh, projects in astrophysics, space-based uh, astrophysics and biological data sharing, which is important. Our um, Office of Science High Energy Physics Program is collaborating with NASA's Science Mission uh, Directorate on the lunar surface uh, electromagnetics experiment at night. Um, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with that, which is a Pathfinder mission uh, to the ultra low noise environment of the lunar far side uh, to detect uh, signals. Um, and then we've got a NASA DOE large area telescope uh, that we uh, jointly work on primary instrument in NASA's uh, uh, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So we, we have a lot of cooperation Super important, and we're going to continue. Thank you. It's much needed, and yeah. you know, NASA Glenn Research uh, Center that we have in Cleveland, Ohio, is often overlooked, and it shouldn't be. Uh, so please keep that in your mind. I do have other questions. I'm going to enter into the record, but thank you for your Very patience good. today, uh, Madam Secretary. I appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. I yield back. The um, what was it she said? The surrogate chair. The <laughs> <laughs> I've from, been called worse. I know, and recently, if you're like me, <laughs> gentlemen from Illinois recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pleasure to see you, Madam Secretary. Um, hey, just before I get started, I'd like unanimous consent to enter into the record a, a recent report from the International Monetary Fund. There's been some discussion about clean energy subsidies, and um, this analysis showed that the United States subsidizes fossil fuels by $650 million a year. That is 20 times as much as we incentivize through the clean through the IRA. And uh, I hope my colleagues who are concerned about distortions in energy markets will work with us on the bigger fish and uh, not the minnows. Um, Secretary Grano, I, I want to, if you'll humor me with a, with a story quick, I was, two weeks ago, was part of a congressional delegation to Norway, and it was a fascinating place, and I felt like I was time traveling five years forward in the United States. Wow. The, they have an almost, as I'm sure you know, an almost 100% renewable electric grid, which gives their, their citizens access to very cheap, very clean energy. It's allowed them to electrify huge parts of their economy. You know, we went to <clears throat> ports in Oslo where all the boats are electric, and so people are swimming in the back of the boat because there's no worry about diesel exhaust that's out there. 80% of all new vehicle sales were electric, and they are justifiably proud of what they've done. Um, I then did my best not to cause a diplomatic incident by beating them up over the fact that 10% of all the energy they produce is for domestic consumption, 90% of the energy they produce is oil and gas that they sell to Europe, and of course they've gotten in some, some heat from some of the Europeans about how much money they made on the back of the Ukraine war, um, you know, essentially wartime profiteering, if you will. Um, the Norwegian government, I think, had their highest revenue year ever <clears throat> and their highest margin on the, the tax receipts from these oil and gas exports. And I don't say that to beat up on the Norwegians, and, and in, in fairness, I did say to them, I would, I'm not criticizing you for anything that I wouldn't criticize our own government for, but I fear that we are on that same trajectory. The Total oil demand in the United States is about the same now as it was 10 years ago. Coal demand is down about 40%. Um, natural gas is growing, but growing much slower than the economy. And our oil and gas sector is increasingly an export industry. And much like Norwegians, Americans like having cheap energy. Um, American oil and gas companies also like making money. And what I'd like to know is how you are thinking, both with the DOE and with the broader agency, of what is our strategic long-term plan for LNG export terminals? Um, and I guess maybe start just with a very narrow DOE question. Uh, 
we are not, the gas industry is not building LNG terminals because they are committed to the health and welfare of the Ukrainian people. They're building because it it's a fantastic arbitrage opportunity. And has DOE or the Energy Information Administration done any assessment of the degree to which the construction of LNG terminals is increasing the exposure of domestic gas consumers to European price volatility? Yeah, um, actually there have been a couple of, uh, or there was a report done by, or is in the middle of being done by the Energy Information Administration on this question. And the impacts, honestly, are, are marginal in terms of what it means for U.S. consumers because there's such an abundant supply. However, to your, the first part of your question, which is the LNG, uh, what part of the mix should that be, or at least what, how do we think about that? Um, like every nation, we should be thinking about what is happening to GHG emissions uh, and LNG produces them. Even though it's cleaner than coal, we know that. We know that we also, and even though our LNG uh, may be cleaner than uh, from some other places, we still have to work on cleaning it up, meaning getting emissions abatement uh, is important. We've, we've, so I'll just and, say that. Well, and I, and I guess just, I mean, just to say the same thing I said to the Norwegians, they had the same conversation. Our oil and gas is so clean because all our refineries are on electric, fine, until you burn it. And, right, right. and, if, and if, if we're framing this as a transition fuel, then sell it at cost, mm. right? Because otherwise we're creating this situation where our consumers want cheap and clean energy and we're giving it to them. Mm. But if our economy is dependent on selling our oil and gas to somebody else at the highest possible cost, we can talk a good game about transition fuels, but we're creating an economic incentive for ourselves to keep this, make this a permanent situation. And, you know, maybe to get this to, like, you know, a, a meteor question, what steps are we taking to make sure that those LNG terminals we're building are in our national interest as required by the Natural Gas Act? Right. That's, that's the, exactly the question we should be asking. That's exactly what we're evaluating inside of the Department of Energy. What's in our national interest, um, given all of the terminals that have already been permitted? Yeah. And, you know, we've got, like, 49 BCF. Yeah that have been permitted of export. And we're currently exporting about 13 billion. I, so I, I, I see I'm out of time, but I, I would just close with the same comment I made to the Norwegians, that if we were sending troops to Ukraine right now, we would have people up in arms saying, why are you allowing the gas industry to be in the wartime profiteering business? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to have that conversation before we send troops, not just because the people who are over there don't have a US flag on their uniforms. Uh, Yield back. Mr. Ranking Member Substitute, since you brought up Norway, did you know on Norwegian ships they have a barcode? Did you know that? Do you know why that is? Uh -oh. So that when they come into port, they can scan the Navy in. Oh, my God. <laughs> the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Wow. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I, thank you, Secretary Granholm, for uh, your... Mr. Chair... I'm sorry, which gentleman from California? The, the good-looking gentleman from California. <laughs> I stand corrected. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> wow, interesting 30 seconds there. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, if you're transitioning out of your home, you should sell it at cost, uh, Mr. Kasten, by the way. Uh, Madam Secretary, it's good to see you again. Uh, we last saw each other in uh, March, uh, I believe, during the, uh, the Appropriations uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee hearing. Uh, I represent a district in Southern California where we're getting crushed uh, by energy prices, not just gas prices. We have $5 a gallon gas, of course. Uh, so I, I purchased an electric vehicle thinking I can avoid that, uh, but now I have uh, power bills that are approaching $1,000 a month uh, in my house. So I don't have anything extravagant, I just have an electric vehicle. We also have $200 natural gas bills every month in California, and we've got solar panels now that have been regulated and the cost's been driven up to the point where they're also cost prohibitive. In this hearing earlier, you said that the Department of Energy, or I guess this administration, doesn't have any effect on the price of oil. I, I don't understand that. You don't believe that, do you? Meaning we don't set the price of oil. You have an effect on the price of oil, though. Well, I, I, we are at record levels of oil production. If that's what you mean, we you're are, talking about the supply and demand no, that's not issue? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking what are you about... Talking about? production, I'm talking about the, the price of oil right now. We're right now at $90 a barrel, right? 
the administration, you released, uh, uh, the, uh, and President Biden announced in November of 2021 that to give relief uh, to Americans at the pump, you were going to release $50 million uh, of, uh, or excuse me, 50 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. At that time, the price of oil was at $79 a barrel. We are now at $90 uh, a barrel. Um, supply and demand is greatly affected by what the government does, the release of the SPR, the release uh, and production of oil, but also the replenishment of it. Um, I've got a chart here, and I've got a copy at your desk there if you want to look at it closer. This is a, a, a historic chart, really since the beginning of when we started the Strategic Petroleum Reserve inputs. Uh, you can see we are here right now in terms of what is in our reserves. Uh, we haven't been at this level since 1983. And before that, we were actually accumulating reserves at that point. In March, during our hearing, you said you were going to bring us a plan on how you were going to replenish the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. We haven't seen that plan yet. And now we're at $90 a barrel for oil. We're, again, at close approaching record oil, uh, excuse me, gas prices at the pump, especially in California. It's backbreaking. What are, what are we doing to lower the cost of energy and specifically to lower the cost of gas to the average consumer who can't afford to transition to an exotic electric vehicle or doesn't want to deal with the cumbersome uh, you know, uh, headwinds that electric vehicles provide some of us. It's not easier to have an electric vehicle, by the way. Even though I drive one, it's not easier to drive an electric vehicle than it, than it is to have a conventional internal combustion engine. You've painted our country into a corner now where our only option is to ask for help and, and a handout from Russia, the Middle East, and China. So what is our plan to, to get us out of this corner without actually buying more oil from those guys, which is, by the way, a lot dirtier source of oil uh, than the oil that we produce uh, in the United States. What, what is our plan for this? So we're at $90. I, I wish we, 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 you know, you're good at trading stocks, obviously. We had that conversation about Proterra. We, we have sold off oil, and now we are at $90 a barrel with no reserves uh, since, uh, record low reserves since 1983. What's our plan? I mean, to say, one, um, our strategic petroleum reserve is the largest in the world. It still is the largest in the world, and we do have a plan. Uh, number one, thank you very much. We canceled the congressional sales, which is 140 million barrels, uh, which is great. So that means it, we are not- When are you going to market to purchase more oil for, this, for we, the reserves? We've gone one time. Uh, we got 6 million barrels. The price went up because of what OPEC did. We're okay, just to give an example of the scale of what we're talking about, we're, we're no, at- uh, but let me finish. What is our current reserve level right now? Uh, three, what have you got there? 300 and- 350, 350 million barrels. Yeah, 350 million. So you just talked about six, six million. No, but I'm just right, saying, what, we are replacing- the one, There was 180 million barrels that we're, that we're, ta we're talking about. Canceled uh, the congressional sales, that's 140 million. We're buying back when the price is uh, advantageous. We sold it at, on average, $94, million, $94 uh, a barrel. Uh, when, the, when the 180 were sold, on average, we sold at 94. When are, we we buying, wanna, when are we buying more? We will be buying more when we f feel like it is best advantageous for the taxpayer. So that's on tack, and we're going to do exchanges. Are you comfortable with where our million. reserve levels are right now? Uh, I'm not worried about the reserve levels at all. It is the largest Are you comfortable with where our energy world. prices are right now? No, I'm never comfortable with where energy prices okay. are. I'm out of time. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from my colleague from California, Mr. Liu. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Secretary Granholm, for your leadership. Within the Department of Energy is the National Nuclear Security Administration that does a great job trying to prevent nuclear proliferation. Uh, also within Department of Energy, you have the Biological and Environmental Research Program, uh, whose mission uh, is to seek their underlying biology of plants and microbes as they respond to and modify their environments. So Department of Energy has its hand in both nuclear and biotechnology issues. And my question to you is about the impact of generative AI. And I have a very specific question. With the advent of generative AI, it's given individual humans, immense potential for power and knowledge in a way perhaps not seen before. Uh, that also includes people who want to do bad things, uh, includes terrorists, uh, includes uh, criminals. If you were to go on ChatGPT and ask, tell me how to make a nuclear dirty bomb, 
the current version would say it would be highly irresponsible to provide that answer. And that's because ChatGPT is not open source. Other companies have taken a different approach. So Meta has put out Llama 2, which is a very large journey of AI model that also provides answers to questions. It is open source, and there are lots of benefits to open source. It can also have its guardrails removed much easier. And you could potentially have a world where people could, in fact, ask these large generative models with guardrails removed, hey, how do I make a nuclear dirty bomb? Or how do I make uh, a virus that can cause the next pandemic? And I want to see if you or the Department of Energy has a view on whether these large generative AI models should be open source at all. Um. As you rightly note, we are responsible for nuclear non-proliferation. So the example you give is a very ripe one. Um, we would be very concerned about open access to that kind of information because it is utterly dangerous to the world and to our citizens. Is there a, and I appreciate the conversation that Congress is having on AI at the moment. Um, we've, we've got a couple of um, efforts inside of DOE and with NSF regarding AI and how we make sure that it's both accessible for good, but that we have guardrails for bad, bad AI. And so um, we have the, the very large exascale computers. We want to be the place where we build these foundational models, but we do that with the guardrails that are necessary to protect our citizens. That's a general statement. It has to be worked through, obviously. The, you, you have to carve this with a scalpel and not with an ax. But I think it's very important that for the safety of the planet, we do not put out information where nefarious actors can um, take us to pieces. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned exoskeletal computers. Uh, as you know, the Department of Energy has a huge role in increasing the speed of computing power, uh, including as well uh, quantum computers. I know you have made a lot of grants uh, to various uh, quantum computing applications. I don't know what the world looks like in, let's say, 10 years, where you have you know, ChatGPT version 12, and then you've got quantum computing that can go a million times faster. But I do know I would like the US to be in the lead. And so I want to ask, do you think you have enough money right now in terms of doing research R&D on quantum computing and other kinds of faster computing applications? Yeah, I mean, I guess that, that's an easy answer. The answer is no, because we do know that our competitors uh, are out there and investing a lot more than we are, and perhaps don't have the same kind of guardrails or thoughts about the nefarious uses of either quantum or AI. And so we need to build up our defenses, and that means we need to be able to hire the people. We need to be able to have the systems in place to make, that, make us safe. Right. Uh, thank you. And then my last Question is more uh, simply a request. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has done a great job coming up with a risk-based AI framework that can be applied to governmental agencies, the private sector, uh, and other organizations. And so I'd like to ask you and Department of Energy to look at that framework and apply it to the Department of Energy. Uh, Zoe Lofgren and I uh, and others have written a letter to the Biden administration basically saying, hey, look, this NIST agency has come up with this great framework. Why don't you then apply it to uh, your entire administration? So if you could look into that, that'd be great. great. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentlewoman from Oklahoma, Ms. Bice. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Granholm, for being with us this afternoon. Um, I want to start with a line of questioning that occurred earlier in the hearing from my colleague from California, Mr. Issa, talking about the efficiency standards that are being put forward by the Department of Energy and the impact on consumers. You indicated that there is no um, push for you to eliminate any of these particular appliances or household uh, items. In fact, you just want to see the efficiency standards increase. But I want to point out a couple of things to you that I think are relevant. Um, in the Federal Register, which details out your uh, review of the efficiency standards for ceiling fans, it is noted that there is a uh, $16.69 savings 
uh, if the efficiency standards that you are proposing are met, um, which would have a simple payback of 4.1 years. Uh, but what is not talked about in here, uh, and by the way, uh, and at the average ceiling fan lasts 10 years plus, so you're talking a dollar and 69 cents for a consumer uh, per year that they would save. But what's not being talked about is the impact on the manufacturing of these particular appliances. And in the document, it is stated that it is estimated that the industry would occur conversion costs of $107 million. That is an estimate. So what that translates to is those costs, those manu increased manufacturing costs are actually going to be passed on to consumers. So in essence, you're actually going to cost uh, consumers more money by these efficiency standards not reducing their costs. So I want to point that out. I think this is just one example. It happens to uh, many of the other proposals that you put forward for energy efficiencies on uh, gas stoves and refrigerators and washers and dryers, you name it. Um, I want to pivot to a comment that you made earlier about the Office of the Inspector General. Is it correct that you asked for a increase in the um, IAG budget for 24? Yeah, I think um, that this is what was asked for. Um, you know, we, we obviously support the, so the FY24 request included $165 million for the OIG, which was more than double what the 23 enacted was, which was $86 million. Okay. Let me ask this question. Why was that uh, amount not asked for prior? And here's why I ask. Uh, the IIJA and the IRA, which were passed previous to this Congress, um, actually had a incredibly small amount proportionately of money given to the Inspector General uh, for those two programs. Uh, and let me give you some, a little bit of, of maybe background and numbers. Under the IIJA CHIPS and the IRA, Congress authorized or appropriated $127.5 billion to the DOE and increased the DOE's direct loan guarantee authority by $350 billion. However, both those three programs only appropriated a small amount of the money to the IG to oversee these funds, and you've already begun doling them out and plan to do so over the next five years. Why were you not adamant when these programs are being put together and passed um, in the last Congress by Democrats, why were you not insisting that more money go to the IG to be able to oversee these programs so that when your organization is doling out these funds, you can ensure that you're not wasting taxpayer money? Yeah, we, we want to make sure that we're not uh, waiting. But, but you had members. the opportunity to do that with these bills and didn't. As a matter of fact, IAJA, uh, the percentage of that particular bill going to the depart to the um, inspector general is 0.1%, and the IRA is 0.05%. When the, when the, um, the, the benchmark is 0.35%. Um, the money has started to flow. And we've requested double the amount of money, and we want the. But why did you general, not ask for it previous to now? Well, we're we're These asking bills were for passed double a year or two now. ago. I mean, we're asking for double. We we support the, you know, the inspector general. So you want to you want inspector wanna, general comes and makes their own case here too. So and they have based on these numbers, you have the ability. Let me also make one other I think uh, note here that there's actually been a request from the inspector general's office to allow for um, some additional funding to be transferred to them. Uh, House Energy and Water Appropriations Bill has proposed a transfer of unobligated funds to the department. Um, but you haven't supported that transfer. Why are you trying to, um, you know, hide or not be transparent with taxpayer money? Can I just say, you know, we requested last year an increase of 100, we requested 107 million, but it was Congress that funded only at 86 million. Well, but you also had the opportunity to actually put money into these programs initially and didn't ask for that. I think it's troubling that the Department of Energy doesn't want to be transparent with taxpayer money. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. We will go next to my colleague from California, Mr. Mullen. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Madam Secretary, uh, for your testimony. My home state of California is no stranger to the impacts of climate change or extreme weather events. Uh, this year alone, unprecedented atmospheric rivers caused devastating flooding in my district in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
And just last month, the first ever tropical storm watch was issued for Southern California. There's no question we need to urgently address uh, the climate crisis. One critical step we have to take is to speed up our transition from vehicles that are powered by fossil fuels to ones that run on clean energy sources like electric batteries and hydrogen fuel. Yet this week, the majority will be asking us to vote on legislation, H.R. 1435, which would be very harmful to this effort. This bill in particular would undermine California's role in setting clean emission standards and eliminate its ability to require uh, by 2035 that all vehicles sold in the state run on electric power. I was proud to fight for this and other policies to speed our state's transition to clean energy when I served in the California legislature. I understand the complexities that this transition brings and the research, development, and deployment of EV supporting technologies that are needed to make this switch a reality. And I, and I understand that DOE is leading this critical R&D work. So uh, my question, Madam Secretary, uh, is can you please provide an update on the work that DOE is currently doing to make our transition to EV safe, reliable, and practical in the near future, and what gaps currently exist that Congress might fill? Oh, thank you for the question. Yes, we are doing um, everything from um, supply chain work to make sure we have it in the United States, to the building of the vehicles in the United States, to the selling of the vehicles at a lower cost because of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, it's less expensive if, you, if it's made in the United States, to putting out charging stations across the nation so that we can address the issues of range anxiety and everybody has access to it, to continuing the research and development on battery costs, which is the, the, the main reason why electric vehicles have been more expensive. Um, we are, our goal is to get 50% uh, of vehicles sold uh, by 2030. California is, I know, more aggressive than the nation uh, is on this, but we do believe that the cost of electric vehicle operation and maintenance will bring down energy prices for, for people. Uh, it's certainly been true. Uh, my home is in California as well. I have an electric vehicle. I know that it was said uh, before that it costs more money. Honestly, uh, I drive on sunshine. I have solar panels and electric vehicle, and uh, it has reduced our energy costs enormously in our family. We'd love to make that available to everybody. Thank you for that, Madam Secretary. And on the question of EV batteries. Uh, addressing gaps in our R&D of advanced automotive technologies is critical. One area that uh, you cited, and I understand faces particular challenges, uh, is advanced battery systems and extending vehicle range, which is necessary uh, before we'll see widespread adoption uh, across the board. So uh, how is DOE supporting the research, demonstration, and deployment of advanced battery systems to overcome current energy storage issues with EVs and how is the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, supporting this vital work of the- Yeah, I mean, first of all, we are um, financing the um, development and the, um, you know, the development of critical minerals for batteries, both on e extraction, but also on substitute materials. I uh, in vet doing research and development on substituting expensive materials like cobalt, for example, lithium. Um, we're also um, investing in, in recycling recycling these batteries and recycling the materials so they can be reused uh, again for electric vehicles. The, that whole suite of research and development is happening in the department, but it's also happening out and around. I mean, California, uh, I've got my list, uh, has 23 investments uh, in clean energy, not just in uh, batteries, but in clean energy, but a lot in the battery supply chain. Uh, across the country this is, is happening and the Inflation Reduction Act is making that uh, possible. So we're excited to be able to produce the whole vehicle and the charging stations and the experience of having low cost driving uh, in the United States so that we can really address range anxiety and get an electrified transportation system. Thank you for your leadership, Madam Secretary. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from Mr. McCormick from Georgia. Sir, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Secretary uh, Granholm, for your testimony today. I appreciate you. Uh, for the first time in over 30 years, a uh, nuclear reactor has come online in the United States in my <laughs> home state of Georgia. As a matter of fact, we have one plant that just came online. We have another one that's supposed to come online before the end of the year, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it's producing a significant amount of energy and, and 
hopefully it, it drives costs down and it, and it secures our network. Um, the problem is how long it took and how expensive it got. And if you compare us to a country like France, who's been using nuclear power for quite some time, it's safe, it's effective, relatively safe. Of course, there's always going to be things that can happen, as we've seen in Japan and in the United States, but hopefully those are just blips. One of the things I'm concerned about, if we're going to look to something that's, that's clean and efficient like this into the future, what can we do to reduce the regulatory burden? Because what I've found is we're not safer than France, but it's taken us sometimes up to five, six times longer because of regulation that's not making us safer. It's just making it slower and more expensive. How can we streamline this process to help places like, companies like Vogel continue to produce something that's beneficial to the community and, and keeps the environment clean? Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question. I know the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is looking at its processes uh, because obviously they're the entity that regulates uh, nuclear power plants, and that's true, especially for these uh, newer reactors, the small modular reactors, uh, so that we can make sure that they don't take as long. I mean, Vogel was a, a first of its kind in decades uh, kind of event, and I think people have learned a lot from what happened uh, at Vogel as we move forward. I think that, um, you know, Westinghouse, et cetera, are taking the designs and um, marketing them across the world and taking lessons uh, from them. But I do think uh, that we do need to look at the regulatory side to make sure that we are safe, but that we can do it in a more streamlined fashion. So I agree with you on that. And I think that is actually, that process is underway right now, I think, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So you think we'll have less regulation, burdensome regulation? Well, I, nobody wants burdensome regulation. I think uh, having streamlined regulation that still does the task of keeping us all safe uh, is what we would strive for. Yeah, one of the things I worry about is when government steps in and wants to take uh, any risk out of it whatsoever, and, and I understand risk. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I've landed aircraft on carriers for years at a time, mm. and there's always risk to everything we do, but we get better at it. Right. When, we, when we allow ourselves to actually forge into that community and do some, conquer a, a challenge like that. Uh, you, you just mentioned the micro uh, reactors, which, which I think are fascinating, especially when it comes to space and how we generate power of significance, not just from solar power, but actually nuclear power, something that can actually weaponize too uh, to get rid of other weapons, if you will. Um, what is the regulatory burden on that community? How do we free up communities inside of this, this civilian and, and government relationship where we can actually advance that technology, where we can actually uh, look to the future in space travel and, and what we have to do to, to come up with significant um, energy production in outer space and, and small nuclear reactors. Yeah, I mean, when you think about uh, nuclear power uh, in submarines, for example, um, we've successfully done that in a safe way, the Navy has, for, for decades and decades. Um, can it be, can those reactors have social acceptance in a commercial setting uh, or uh, for space? I mean, those, the defense agencies would uh, probably talk to one another about what the propulsion systems look like for space travel. But uh, I know that we've been successful uh, underwater and I'm convinced that nuclear, if it's done right, it can be safe in, in many environments. So when it comes to marrying up government, I'm going to go back to the government versus civilian, because obviously when you talk nuclear, everybody gets very worried. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to empower civilians. We look at SpaceX and what it's done around the world. Let's look at, there's several people that are coming up with small nuclear reactors that are literally, really small that can uh, propel uh, all kinds of civilian aircraft or, and spaceships. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get to that point where we agree on what's safe to give up to the civilian world in order to accomplish this mission? Yeah, it's a big question, right? How do we agree? I think that uh, there, the notion of public acceptance uh, comes with experience, with people feeling like, okay, it's been done there, um, I'm okay, same, do we have a good regulatory environment that protects us? I mean, that's what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is all about safety. That's their number one you know, raison d'etre. And so I think people want that. And the question is, how can we um, use this power, use it safely, and use it with public acceptance? And I think having a strong regulatory system, but that is streamlined, is important. Sounds like we have a little work to do. Thank yeah. you. With that, I yield.
Gentleman yields back. We'll hear next from the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the chair and ranking member for holding this important hearing. And uh, welcome, Secretary Granholm. And let me thank you, uh, not only for your excellent leadership at uh, a premier uh, uh, department, DOE, but also for your determination to implement what I think is transformational policy and uh, bills that have been signed into law. It is incredible to see the work that the department is doing to tackle the climate crisis with innovative science and technology solutions. I'm deeply proud of what we accomplished last Congress to bolster the U.S. research and innovation through the landmark CHIPS and Science Act, Inflation Reduction Act, and of course the bipartisan infrastructure law. Now we must use every tool at our disposal to achieve our climate goals and carbon removal will be a vital part of this approach with some very robust goals. This is why I'm introducing the Carbon Removal R&D Act to launch a 10-year multi-agency program for carbon removal research, development, and demonstration, which I believe is complementary to the DAC hub funding that has been recently awarded. So Secretary Granholm, what does the department see as the next steps in advancing carbon removal research. Yeah, thank you for your uh, leadership on this. Obviously this is, um, you know, carbon removal is like removing waste, right? And so having government involvement is important because it may not be something that the private sector just takes up on its own until it's proven out, until there's a, a way to monetize it if there is but the technology itself and advances in that technology are critical. This is why the direct air capture hubs that were announced in, in Texas, oh, hello, you're back, in Texas and in, um, uh, in Louisiana are going to be great demonstrations of how we can do this and how we can do it at scale. So we are looking at that and we're looking at other ways to uh, sequester carbon, to capture carbon as well from a research perspective. We've got um, two and a half million dollar program under the bipartisan infrastructure law for carbon storage validation testing, which is uh, important as well. We uh, recently announced nine selectees for 189 million for the first uh, tranche of funds under the carbon capture demonstration program. So we're doing a, a lot of carbon management, a lot of um, managing of uh, carbon and trying to figure out the best way to remove it from the atmosphere. And I thank you for your leadership on it. Thank you. And I would assume that within that context, there is an effort to ensure that these uh, carbon removal projects deliver robust benefits and avoid any harm to the communities. Of course, as always, there must be a community benefits plan that ensures that a community is participating and benefiting. From, uh, from the investment. Thank you. And last week I visited Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in my district to discuss their plans to become the first university in the world to house an IBM quantum system. For the U.S. to be the global leader in quantum computing, we not excel only at research, but at deploying at scale. So Secretary, what plans does the department have to build on our existing basic research efforts and move toward deployment of quantum-centric supercomputing. Yeah, thank you for this too, because um, quantum is something that, again, uh, a lot of our economic competitor nations are pursuing, and we cannot be eclipsed by them. We've got five national uh, quantum information science research centers at our national labs um, this summer. The centers actually came together to put on a quantum um, summer school with hands-on training, real-world experience for the quantum community. 150 people attended that. They sponsor an annual quantum uh, uh, career fair that attracts this next generation. Super important to get young people interested in this. Um, because of the exponential um, uh, speed that these uh, that that quantum computing uh, possesses. We want to make sure it's done in the right way. We were just having this conversation with Congressman Liu about the combination of quantum plus AI. We want to make sure it's done well and done uh, for good. So the importance of having public participation in this is critical, and investment in it is critical, so that uh, we have the guardrails necessary to protect our society. Well, I thank you for that. I. Um I do know that these bills that we did, the Chips and Science Act, the Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, are truly transformational. 
And what I'm impressed by is how you have implemented as an agency in a way that is co colorblind. And I say that because too many times we're referred to as red districts and blue districts. And I'm hearing from so many that there's investments made in all districts across this country. And this is truly going to be a benefit to communities no matter what zip code in this country, no matter what color district there may, may be defined as. So with that, I thank you for your leadership and your uh, determination. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. The gentleman Chair. yields back. We'll hear next from our colleague from Georgia, Mr. Collins. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Granholm. I, um, I usually like to start out by letting you know I am a freshman here, been here eight months, been in private sector all my life, never been elected to anything, wow. and I am a, a small business person. So I am very much a marketplace person. And uh, that being said, I don't think the government should pick winners and losers and manipulate markets. But it seems that the Biden administration is doing just that by dumping billions of taxpayer dollars into electric vehicle initiatives. And at the same time, they're restricting Americans from accessing the critical minerals necessary to build electrical vehicles. Further, you're all doing this under the guise that electric vehicles are greener or cleaner. So with 60% of American energy generated by fossil fuels, does uh, the subsidizing electric vehicles just shift carbon emissions from cars to power plants while forcing Americans to buy expensive vehicles they don't want? Well, um, I, I don't think anybody's forced. We all believe in choice, right? But if um, somebody wants to try an electric vehicle, there is the subsidy, of course, to reduce the cost. And I think that's good for the planet. I think it's good for Georgia. Georgia has benefited enormously from all of these investments in Georgia as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I was just looking, I think it's 31 investments have come to Georgia, $32 billion of investments, jobs, coming to Georgia. And I would, I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. But, but let the marketplace determine that, not, not the government well, uh, determine that. But, but, ha but having said that, uh, there is initiatives out there to, be, to have so many electric vehicles uh, by 2035, and that is a push, and that is saying that we are going to manipulate and push. The other thing I want to let you know, I sit on Natural Resources Committee, too, and, and I've spent eight months traveling this entire country, ha hearing after hearing, with people that just want to mine, mine critical minerals, mm -hmm. and they're not being allowed to by this government. And, the, and, and what you're seeing is the few mine people that are able to mine, since we only have three smelters in this country, they're shipping that to China. China is producing 80% of our critical minerals. And we're shipping it over there on ships that use diesel. And then we're bringing it back. It just doesn't make common sense. Because you know, like I do, China doesn't have green factories. Mm -hmm. Right. They're big polluters. But the thing is, and, and, and what I want to get to with these critical minerals, is, as a matter of fact, it was just yesterday in a hearing, one of my Democrat colleagues stated that we should increase mass transit to reduce our, our, our reliability on lithium. And we all know that goes to batteries and electric vehicles. Now, that doesn't really seem practical, and we're relying on China for all this lithium. Is it your position that the government should spend billions of dollars on mass transit that very few people can use efficiently instead of just issuing these permits so that we can have the energy sector mine here in our country and drive down the price and have cheaper critical minerals so that people can afford these electric vehicles that are being pushed on them? I, I do agree that we should be doing sustainable mining in this country. And I think that the great news is that the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes the full supply chain Ma for batteries. Ma'am, I saw people that, I, I sat face to face with people that their generations are dying and their towns are drying up because they've been trying to get permits for almost 20 years mm -hmm. to mine. And these people set the, the, the standards on global mining out there. But I, I want to just finish because I only have a minute left yeah. on what I see as, a, as an outsider for eight months. I don't really think this administration wants us to have EV vehicles anyway because they're too expensive for the average public. That young lady, that Democrat colleague yesterday hit the nail on the head. They don't want you to have EVs. Y'all want us to drive, ride in mass transit. You don't even want us to own a car. You don't want us to, you don't want us to own gas stoves, ceiling fans. You want to regulate everything, AC motors and compressors. You want the American public to at one point 
for every decision we make in our life, that we look to you for the answer, to the federal government to decide on what you want best for us. And that's not the American way. And, and that's not right. But that's what I've been seeing for eight months out there. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. That concludes our member question period. I'd like to thank Secretary Granholm for her valuable testimony and uh, thank all of the members of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee for their great questions and the wonderful dialogue. The record will remain open for 10 additional days for comments and written questions from members. With that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>